Welcome. Uh, my name is John Mayo. I am a professor of economics, business, and public policy at Georgetown University. And more importantly for today's purposes, I am the executive director of our host institution, which is the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Some of you are familiar with what we do, but, but others, let me just say briefly that what we do is to seek to promote discussion and dialogue and debate on issues that lie at the nexus of business and public policy. Uh, today, you can't really imagine a more vital sector in which to have that discussion than in the wireless industry. The wireless industry, of course, is one that over just a very few short years has enabled consumers and businesses to do their lives and to conduct business activities in ways that were just simply unimaginable uh, even a decade ago. And that's very exciting, and the result has been tremendous. It's been a boost to the lives of individuals. It's been a boost to the lives of businesses and to our economy. <clears throat> but there is, of course, an economic reality. And the economic reality is <clears throat> that this is an industry that runs on spectrum. Uh, in Latin, the phrase would be sine qua non, without which not, uh, which is perfectly apt here. It, without spectrum, we're not going to have a wireless industry, and without adequate spectrum, the sorts of things that we have taken for granted, low prices, tremendous innovation and investment, simply won't happen. So today we have uh, a, a goal of teeing up a discussion of how we might best move forward in that. And we are just thrilled to have a distinguished set of experts in this regard. And notably, the experts are from academia, from the policy sector and from industry. And so we're going to have uh, a spectrum of views on spectrum, if you will. So we're excited about that. Now let me just say a, ro a, minute, a, a word or two about your role here today, because you may be thinking your role was simply to have a bagel and to have coffee and to be a passive participant. And that's not really what I have in mind. Uh, as I looked yesterday at the list of people that have RSVP'd to this event, I was struck, overwhelmed, if you will, by the amount of expertise on these issues that we're going to be discussing today that, of the people that are going to be in the room today. So uh, in any other day, we could just grab a random cross-section of you and not with meaning to disparage our wonderful speakers. We wouldn't suffer so much in our panel presentations if any three of you were up here uh, doing a panel presentation than the ones, the, the folks that we have up here. So what I'd love to do is, number one, I'd like to encourage you to be an active participant. We're going to do everything we can to preserve time for you to ask Q&As and to have that dialogue and discussion. So let me encourage you to do that. Uh, in that regard, a logistical issue is that there's going to be a, we're recording this event. So if you would wait for a microphone uh, to come to you so that, so that the audio portion of your question is picked up and not just simply the answer. The second thing is we're dealing with an industry, uh, we're talking about the wireless industry, and of course today in a modern world, conversations can occur in multiple uh, 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 veins, and, and one option is for you to participate in the discussion and conversation uh, real time on Twitter. Uh, if you look on the bottom of your handout or on the bottom of the screen, you'll see uh, a way to participate, which is hashtag GCBPP forum. Uh, so you can participate in that way as well. So we're, we're uh, encouraging you to participate in that way as well. Now, let me, without further ado, turn to our first keynote speaker for this morning, Tom Power. Tom is the Deputy Chief Technology Officer at the White House for Telecommunications Policy. And of course, in that role, what he does is to uh, vitally participate in shaping, designing, and implementing telecommunications policy, including spectrum policy, for the administration. Uh, it is a, a tremendously important position. Uh, it's one that I think we all would like to hear uh, from his perspective, what the administration is, is doing in this regard to help enable uh, the, uh, the movement of spectrum into the hands of 
um, of the commercial sector where it is so vitally um, uh, needed. So without, again, further ado, let me turn it over to Tom and please help me welcome him. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be here um, uh, at the National Press Club, and particularly in the First Amendment Lounge. It's got such gravitas. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm in a special cocoon of anti-censorship rays that are, you know, I can say anything I want. It's, uh, <laughs> it's great. Um, although I know that's a matter of perspective. I look at the agenda and I see the First Amendment, and I think about free speech. You're probably looking at the agenda, seeing 45 minutes allocated to me, and you're probably thinking more about the Eighth Amendment and the prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Um, so I will try to be lenient. Um, it is a real honor, and as John said, there are so many experts in the room. Uh, it is great to be with you and with the three folks that I'll be sharing the dais with, uh, Anna Maria and Michael and Scott, who are true experts on this. Um, and also my friend Chris Gutman McCabe, who's always eager to share with us what he's thinking. Um, <coughs> in fact, he's, uh, he's so generous. I get the good laugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's, uh, he's so generous, he's often uh, willing to share with me what I'm thinking, so. <laughs> um, uh, now, you gotta work with me. I, got some, I have some actual spectrum jokes and they're really bad, and if you don't treat me right, I will tell them, so. Um, John, John uh, described this event as a, uh, uh, coming at a time of an inflection point in spectrum, and I think, uh, I think that's right on a number of levels. Um, and I just wanted to share some views from, from where I sit, not so much as, uh, uh, making news, with apologies to Paul, uh, not so much making news, but just sort of giving a, a perspective from where I sit. And uh, John flatters me to include me in the in the world of experts. I'm a lawyer by background. Uh, when I first met Anna Maria and Michael, we were back thinking about cable rates and uh, and UNEP. Um, uh, so from and I and I'm I'm relatively new to really digging into these spectrum issues, uh, and I see my job more as getting the experts. Uh, to, uh, to coordinate their work, both uh, within the government and, and in private industry. So I, I'm, I'm just giving sort of a broader perspective of, of what particularly the last couple of years have looked at from my perspective. Um, as we all know, the president uh, has made a big deal about pushing broadband out to the country uh, ever since the early days of the administration, beginning with the Recovery Act and $7 billion in broadband grants. Um, Th that has segued into a very specific focus on spectrum in a number of ways, um, not just pushing more broadband into the far corners of the country, uh, but also to create more robust broadband in, uh, uh, for, for consumers in more urban areas where uh, data consumption just keeps going through the roof. Um, and outside of personal smartphones and tablets and so forth, uh, it's really exciting to see how spectrum is transforming so many areas of our society and the economy, from uh, energy to manufacturing, uh, healthcare, transportation, machine to machine technologies. Um, just yesterday, Chairman Janikowski uh, announced plans to adopt rules on uh, medical uh, monitoring devices uh, via wireless. Uh, New, we're seeing new apps for uh, public safety and law enforcement. Uh, it's, it's just a really exciting time to be in this world um, where we see so much innovation, job creation, and productivity. Um, the president kicked off what I kind of think of as two work streams in this regard. Uh, early on, there was this recognition that among uh, the challenges was getting more spectrum into the hand of wireless carriers, and that begat the search for 500 megahertz. Um, I was not in the room when that number was, was uh, hatched. I, I was over at NTIA still uh, focusing on the BTOP program. Uh, but as chief of staff at NTIA, uh, w we were going to be charged with coordinating that activity. And I did know that that would be a heavy lift. And I did know that it would take some resources. So uh, actually, my first introduction to this was when we went to the Hill and, and highlighted the need uh, to search for 500 megahertz as part of our budget uh, process going back to February of 2010 as we were preparing for the FY 2011 budget. Um, the reaction to, to the initiative and to that number was pretty positive. Um, it, you know, Congress is not exactly looking for ways to spend money these days. Um, but, uh, but in terms of the need to get more spectrum uh, uh, out of federal users and from other areas, uh, everyone was agreed on that. And, and everybody was talking in the hundreds of megahertz, certainly. So I think most people thought that was a, a very important part of the solution. Um, and then later, uh, the next month, the FCC National Broadband Plan came out, adopting the 500 megahertz goal. And in June of 2010, the president issued his presidential memorandum uh, uh, specifically directing NTIA to work with the FCC 
defined 500 megahertz of spectrum that could be reallocated to commercial uh, uh, broadband within 10 years. Uh, and, and you know, I think the 10-year uh, goal, while it makes us all uh, impatient, that's a long way to wait, uh, I think it was also a realistic goal in terms of that much spectrum. Uh, not that we have to wait for the full 10 years to get any spectrum out, but that in terms of getting 500 megahertz, that was probably a good goal. And he made clear that all options were on the table. If you look back at the memorandum, he talked about licensed and unlicensed. Uh, he talked about clearing and sharing. Um, so NTIA coordinates this work. Uh, there are teams within each federal agency that are hard at work uh, to execute on this plan. Uh, I get to meet with all the agencies every couple weeks. Uh, we spend a few hours going over uh, where we are uh, as we, uh, as we uh, push to get more spectrum freed. Um, we have help from the FCC, of course, and OMB. Um, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really all, all hands on deck. Um, and, and as a result of that, within the first six months, we developed a plan uh, to uh, how we were going to go band by band, uh, finding the 500 megahertz. And in that first six months, we were able to identify 115 megahertz of spectrum that we proposed for reallocation within five years. Um, and then we got to work on the next band, and that was the 1755 band, and that was you know, specifically a response to wireless providers who recognized that as being a very appealing uh, swath of spectrum, uh, particularly the lower 25 megahertz, which, uh, as with the rest of the band, had very appealing propagation characteristics, uh, but was also uh, ripe for sharing with the AWS-3 spectrum. Uh, and was internationally harmonized for, for this purpose, which is a, you know, doesn't get spoken a lot about, I guess maybe because we're all in violent agreement on the point, but that harmonization piece is key because it means that uh, it gives you the scale for devices and, and uh, networks operating on a common uh, platform uh, to bring down costs. Um, now, of course, some in industry found that lower 25 megahertz so appealing uh, that they urged uh, the government to focus just on that lower 25 as opposed to the entire 95 megahertz band. So, you know, on the one hand, it seemed a little ironic that, that as we were all clamoring for uh, hundreds of more megahertz of spectrum, that, that the industry would be saying, just focus on 25, and you had the agency saying, no, let's focus on more. Um, but uh, the industry had a rationale for this as well. Um, their concern was that that whole band was too complex, that focusing on the whole band would take too long, that the cost would be too high, and that uh, that if we really wanted to have, a, have a, a good, solid, quick hit here, we should just focus on the lower 25. Um, and that, you know, is reasonable enough. I don't consider that to be crazy talk. Um, uh, and it, it actually gets to an interesting point about uh, federal assignments. Um, uh, the, the, the way it works, uh, at least when it's working, is uh, federal agencies come in and they ask for assignments that are limited geographically and temporally. So, you have different uh, agencies operating different systems where they are authorized to do so, but only in certain geographical areas or only in certain times of the day. Um, so that, if executed correctly, leads to a lot of efficiencies. On the other hand, when you try to undo that and move folks out of there, you're solving for uh, a lot more systems than just a single agency in a single band. Yeah, there are uh, about 3,200 systems in the 1755 band and 800 alone in the uh, lower 25 megahertz. Um, so, uh, uh, to solving that, um, solving that uh, e even in a, in a smaller portion of the band is still a challenge. And then the agencies were telling us that uh, there are some systems that actually occupy the entire 95 megahertz, so that telling them to move out of the lower 25 was really no different than telling them to move out of the entire 95 anyway. And so if there were costs and complexities involved in that, we would have to face those uh, in any event. And these were agencies that, that had moved from the 1710 band into the 1755 band uh, under this theory that, you know, just move up here and the commercial guys can move in here and we'll all be fine. And now they're being told to move up a little further and move up a little further and then I'll fall off the stage. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm probably giving short shrift to both sides of the argument, but I think NTI got it right uh, when they said, you know, we're driving towards 500 megahertz. Um, and we have this block of 95 in front of us, and everybody uh, agrees that the characteristics of it are very appealing. It's sort of the beachfront territory when it comes to spectrum. And so the plan said, here's a way to make it available. And most importantly, the report said that this doesn't mean we have to solve all of this band at the same time before anybody can move in. Um, we can start auctioning and start transitioning out and start commercial ingress uh, in phases as a transition. 
Um, the, the key, though, from the agency's perspective was to keep in mind the bigger picture. We're driving towards 900. Uh, let's not assume that solving for the lower 25 is the end of the, uh, of the analysis. Um, and uh, uh, so now uh, that's, that's where the work begins. And uh, you know, as I said, there are lots of systems in this band. Um, some will be easier to relocate uh, than others. There are the fixed uh, microwave bands. Um, fairly easy, and the report uh, concluded that that those systems could be relocated within five years. Uh, there are more complicated uh, systems, the uh, air combat training systems, where you know these are not fixed. So you have uh, these jets flying uh, in in uh, testing and training uh, operations, having to talk to ground stations and talk to each other. Uh, a little harder to solve for those. We've got satellites. Uh, in the air, satellites that will be up there for 10 or 20 or 30 years. Um, and um, th this is not a simple change yet. You can't send a tech up to do a software change. Um, it's, it's the life of the satellite. Um, and, and then, of course, further complicating these challenges were uh, how do the federal agencies continue to serve their missions, uh, whether with spectrum or ideally without, uh, if we can find non-spectrum ways to uh, preserve the same capabilities but free the spectrum up. Um, and then there was the issue of cost. Um, the agencies were asked to, to come up with their plans and to put a price tag with it, the cost of relocation. Um, and the, the total figure was a big number, $18 billion. Um, that, that uh, as, as I've, not, I've not personally been through this process before. I, I understand that when this becomes real, uh, OMB gets to get into the game here and, and uh, work their magic, and uh, uh, that was not a part of what what NTI was doing with the agencies. Uh, so so those are just the agency numbers, um, uh, but but clearly it's a challenge because uh, uh, under under law, if we're going to auction the spectrum, we got to recover as much as the costs are. So and and this gets back to the industry point, which is we can't be pursuing this. Uh, lofty goal if at the end of the day the law is actually going to prohibit us from executing. Um, so, so now is when uh, it, we're really rolling up our sleeves and NTIA called for a, a really uh, tight engagement with industry um, to sit down with the agencies, the individual agencies, and go system by system and figure out what makes sense given the complexity of the systems, potential cost of relocation, um, what, kind of, what kind of sharing arrangements uh, would be possible to to lower the costs, um, we one of the terms that gets thrown around a lot these days is multi-stakeholder, but but that's really what this is, um, and it's 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 a bit of a challenge, obviously on a number of levels. But among other things, you know, for each federal system, there's some core of experts at an agency that knows that system and and knows all the details of it. You know, from the commercial side, I, I and I don't mean to oversimplify it for those of you who are going to be taking on this task, but I think it's a little simpler in the stuff in the sense that the systems that are moving in are pretty much the same everywhere. The systems that are moving out are different, so it's a it's a labor intensive uh, uh, effort on the on the federal side, uh, and and my uh, my job is to work with those folks at all the agencies, uh, along with uh, Administrator Strickling at NTIA, uh, and keep the focus on identifying those systems that can be moved or can best be shared. Um, I think the reaction's been pretty good, uh, and in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've seen a lot of, a lot of good reaction. Uh, I was pleased to see uh, T-Mobile filing their uh, application for special temporary authority, where they want to be able to work near federal installations to see how uh, their systems in the 1755 band could coexist uh, with federal systems. Uh, Verizon Wireless came out with an announcement uh, and, and $5 million committed to this venture. And, uh, and I know that these efforts are on top of everything the industry does uh, to promote innovation in these ways, billions of dollars a year in, uh, in infrastructure and R&D. Um, the rollout of LTE, uh, which is a, you know, m a very spectrally efficient technology. Um, the, so that's all, all great news. There's a lot of work, but it's good news. Um, and, uh, but sharing is, is sort of the word of the day from, from our perspective, I suppose. And that, that can take a lot of forms. I think historically we think of exclusion zones um, where uh, uh, federal systems are given protection within geographical areas. Uh, I think in the longer term, uh, we know that uh, there will be different, more maybe uh, technologically focused forms of sharing, uh, smart antennas and sensing and MIMO uh, or MIMO. 
um, databases like the white spaces uh, plan, adaptive radios. Uh, these will all factor into the mix. Bigger term, uh, bigger picture architectural changes with smaller cells, um, allowing more reuse uh, out there. And of course, each of these all have their challenges. Um, uh, the smaller cells in particular probably means more capital expenditures to build uh, fiber out to those cells. Uh, but it's 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 a it's a combination of all these efforts that I think will uh, lead us to uh, what can really be a win-win. So we will uh, be continuing to lean into this effort uh, uh, with the agencies, and uh, we really look forward to to working with the uh, commercial providers and all the stakeholders in this to to make it a big win. Um, I said earlier there were sort of two work streams: um, one, the 500 megahertz; the second. Uh, is sort of the legislative package that we put together and, uh, uh, again, aimed at getting more spectrum in the hands of wireless carriers uh, and ultimately more robust uh, spectrum uh, and broadband to the American consumer. The legislative package included a few other things of note um, on, on license spectrum, uh, on, um, on creating greater incentives for agencies to find spectrum, uh, and also the public safety broadband network. So just to kind of review the, the bidding there, um, the president first really laid the marker down on this one in his State of the Union address uh, last year, 2011, where he talked about the goal of expanding wireless broadband to 98 percent of the country. Um, he followed up by unveiling uh, the details of what we call the National Wireless Initiative at a speech in Marquette, Michigan. Um, and then we put together the, the specifics of the legislation in the American Jobs Act, um, which, uh, which, which uh, a, a version of became law in the middle class tax relief act that the president signed in February after a lot of work by uh, a lot of folks, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, I know in the administration, on the Hill, NTIA, um, uh, and the FCC, uh, a really, a really uh, uh, great outcome, I think. Uh, the typical legislative process, of course, um, we know there are puts and takes. It sometimes feels like these issues pop up and different people are proposing different little pieces of legislative language and they're kind of floating back and forth in the ether and then it's like somebody just blows the whistle and we have a law and it's like, okay, what did we get? Uh, but, uh, but I think it turned out pretty well. Um, so just to touch on a few of the individual items of that, the, the auctions, the incentive auctions, and I know the folks, uh, Anna Maria and Michael will be focusing a lot on that. Um, uh, I just have a few things to say on it. You know, one, thank goodness uh, we got this done. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the FCC really are the experts on, uh, at this. They've proven that over the last couple decades. Um, but, but it's new, uh, the, the incentive auction piece it, uh, in particular, uh, to manage the, the front end of that, followed by sort of the back end of, of the more traditional spectrum auctions. Um, so they have their work cut out for them, uh, but, um, you know, we very much respect their independence and their judgment on these matters. And, uh, of course, uh, putting Ruth Milkman and Gary Epstein as the folks in charge of that, I think probably most of you are familiar with those two and, uh, and share uh, certainly my belief that you couldn't have two uh, finer people and more you know, intelligent, experienced, great judgment. So we're very optimistic about that. Um, uh, there was the unlicensed piece. And again, I think from the administration's perspective, we were most interested in simply preserving some runway for the FCC uh, to have flexibility in that regard. Um, things, uh, things move quickly and in ways that we can't predict. Uh, technology always kind of leads the way. Um, there have to be some rules of the road, and we just wanted the FCC to have some flexibility to, to move nimbly and, um, and quickly uh, to respond to technological changes. Um, uh, interestingly, we see how much even the, the licensed wireless carriers in, in, uh, uh, rely on unlicensed Wi-Fi for offloading their data. Um, I should, I should, uh, well, let me show you something. Um, now, you've, you've all seen one of these before, of course. This is my personal iPad. Uh, it's a very special iPad. Probably can't tell. It is 3G enabled. Um, and I think I'm the only one who fell for that. Uh, <laughs> 130 bucks, you know? Never used it. And they have these plans, these great plans, right? You can just buy it for a month and cancel and turn it back on. Uh, never, ever used it. Um, it's a little, little embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> I can't really go to Georgetown anymore because when I walk by the Apple store, you know, they all, they all drop what they're doing and they run to the window and they go, there he goes. <laughs> He's the guy. It's embarrassing. <laughs> Last time I walked by, this guy said, hey, uh, that's a nice belt you're wearing. Can we sh uh, sell you some suspenders to go with that? <laughs> 
But but the point is, it's a Wi-Fi device. It, you know, it it really is, and it's it's this wonderfully popular device, and it's got all sorts of innovations, and it's driving productivity, uh, hundreds of thousands of apps, uh, and and you know what? Without Wi-Fi, where you know would that have ever come about? So uh, we continue to believe there's a very important role for unlicensed. Um, uh, one other important piece of all this. Um, uh, the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act and the changes to that act uh, that we brought about in the new legislation. Um, uh, this really gets to this issue of incentives uh, for federal agencies. Um, in the past, uh, agencies have been, um, you know, instructed, directed, whatever, to, to turn over more spectrum, uh, but there's no great incentive them, for them to do so. And it's not that they don't want to, it's not that they're not doing their jobs. But part of their jobs is to execute on core agency missions that require spectrum. And there are spectrum managers who's, you know, when that's what they're paid to do, they kind of want to hold on to that spectrum unless they have incentives to do otherwise. And it's just difficult in the, in the uh, uh, government space to do that. Um, so we got some good changes, though, in the legislation uh, uh, that, that the Spectrum Relocation Fund can now help pay for p upfront planning costs, not just the cost of the relocation itself, but upfront planning. Uh, it can help pay even if the Spectrum is going to be turned over for sharing purposes as opposed to uh, exclusive commercial use. Um, and it can also be used to fund equipment investments that actually represent an upgrade to the status quo. This is a real incentive, right? It's, it's, you're not going to just do a whole bunch of work to come out where you were before you're going to do some work to come out where you were before, plus uh, potential upgrades in efficiency and in the systems and hardware and software that are running those systems. Um, so that's great. I mean, I, you know, in my dreams, think about, you know, could we, couldn't we do this in the, the way we do it in the commercial sector, which is, you know, pay somebody a $50,000 bonus to come up with Spectrum, uh, but we don't pay bonuses uh, anymore. <laughs> um, but it, it is, uh, it is uh, funny, but I, you know, I was thinking, I, I think I said this, uh, uh, maybe down in CTIA last week, you know, if you said to a cabinet secretary, well, you know, your job is to turn over a bunch of spectrum over the next year and we'll put a price tag on it uh, at the end of the year to value it and then we'll pay you 25% of that amount um, and, and OMB doesn't get to offset it. Um, you know, you, this is actually yours. Um, you know, you'd get more spectrum, uh, you'd get more productivity in the marketplace, you'd have some fired up cabinet members and bureaucrats. Um, but you know, there are always reasons why you can't do these things, and you know, the way the budget process works, the way OMB works, is we don't want folks, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the budget process instills a lot of discipline, and, and all of the, uh, one of the frustrations here is that a lot of the approaches towards creating incentives, they sort of go along that line, which is, you know, you'll get paid for your spectrum, for, for your giving back of spectrum in some way, but agencies don't have bottom lines. Agencies don't have profits. They don't have shareholders to impress. So, uh, so it's never really real. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, the the changes we made in the CSEA in this new legislation uh, will do the trick. Um, the other the other big uh, part here um, is uh, uh, the public safety broadband network. Uh, it's a whole discussion unto itself. But it's a it's a great achievement, a real heavy lift. Um, but Allocating the D block to a new entity that will uh, to de 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 design and, and oversee the deployment of a wireless interoperable public safety network. Uh, the D block plus seven billion dollars. Um, uh, the folks at NTIA are real busy on this, setting up the uh, first net, the uh, uh, first responders network authority that will be doing this, um, putting the board together, and then kind of handing the reins uh, over to them. Um, uh, to to embark on what's going to be a great, uh, what I hope is a great achievement uh, uh, for the country. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of the way I see things. Um, uh, I often read folks saying how we need to move more quickly. We need to move more uh, uh, with more energy. More leadership is needed. Um, and and I you know I, I can't argue with that. I think that's a great message. Uh, I I take it all as encouragement. Um, I do think. Some folks tend to suggest that maybe we could just snap our fingers and suddenly um, uh, there'll be more spectrum available. Um, but as I said, it's a complicated uh, um, system, and, and you know I think even the folks who who uh, exhibit all impatience from time to time understand that we don't want to give up on air combat training systems. 
Uh, we don't want to stop using unmanned vehicles in the fight against terrorism. Uh, we want law enforcement to have video surveillance and other uh, important systems that, um, that rely on spectrum. Um, and that the 10-year plan for 500 megahertz is, is a reasonable timeline. That's not to say relax or slow down, just the opposite. Um, uh, but we do have to realize that there are real uh, missions being executed on the spectrum. I had, uh, uh, there are a lot of cool things about my job. Uh, one of them was uh, last Saturday, uh, I was able to uh, attend a, a ceremony in the White House Rose Garden um, celebrating the nation's top cops. Uh, these were about 30 police officers who had uh, uh, been honored for really, really heroic uh, efforts in the line of duty. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have the privilege of working side to side with them, but I do have the privilege of working side to side with the folks who manage the spectrum that, that uh, allow a lot of our first responders and other of our nation's heroes to do their job. And, um, you know, they take those jobs uh, really seriously, um, uh, and, uh, and that's what they're paid to do. So, uh, you know, there are, there are lots of challenges in front of us. Um, there are, uh, but huge opportunities, obviously, for the nation in terms of our convenience, but, but especially in terms of the economy and productivity. Um, so uh, I know we can improve things on the federal side. The GAO came out with a report a year or two ago identifying situations where uh, federal agencies had assignments that they weren't using and didn't know about. So I, I, you know, there's, there's clearly efficiency to be had on the federal side. Uh, we will keep pushing on that and, and really look forward to uh, uh, to working with the commercial side and all the stakeholders uh, to make this a, a big win for all of us. Um, I think we are truly at an inflection point, as, as John has put it, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really wonderful opportunity for the country. I think maybe I'll just cut it off there and maybe take a few questions if... Uh... First, let's thank Tom for his affirmative talk. Tom and all the speakers have graciously agreed to take some questions. So again, let me remind you that the, uh, we encourage your participation. There are microphones that will be available. If you'll just raise, simply raise your hand, a microphone will come to you. And then if you would, just so that we know the diversity of folks in the room and, and uh, where they're from, identify yourself and then ask the question. Uh, Paul Kirby with TR Daily. Tom, uh, you talked about leadership. Uh, Commissioner McDowell last week at CTIA said that he thinks the administration, the, the White House should show more leadership in, in basically urging the federal agencies to relinquish spectrum. I just wanted to give you a chance to respond to that. Well, you know, like I said, I, I'm, I, you know, it's great that folks are impatient and are pushing us. I, uh, but I will tell you the way I think about that is like, if I'm a football player and I'm breaking down the field, heading for the goal line and the crowd is yelling, go, go, go faster. Yeah, exactly, I'm doing it. Uh, we're doing it. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, I, I, I welcome, I, I take it as an encouragement and I welcome the encouragement and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic about the outcome. Other questions? I've got that spectrum joke, by the way. You're, you don't. You're not. Morning, Todd Shields, a reporter with Bloomberg News. Uh, more on Mr. McDowell's comments. He seemed to suggest that the $18 billion figure that NTIA came up with was accepted at face value from the agencies, and there needs to be pushback and asking the agencies, does it really cost that much? Can you winnow that number down? Uh, how will you go about that, if at all? Uh, I, as I said earlier, I, I, I have not uh, been in the trenches on this process before, but as I understand what would normally happen is OMB gets engaged and, and scrubs the numbers. So it just wasn't a part of this process. It's not, a, you know, I wouldn't say NTIA accepted at face value any more than you do. Uh, it just was what, what the agencies were directed to do was to come up with a number and then we move forward from there with OMB's help. But when does OMB get into the process? Well, I think we'll see. Uh, uh, so what's gonna happen is uh, under the aegis of the CISMAC, the uh, uh, Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee, uh, is where the, the carriers and the agencies are going to get together to start <laughs> studying systems. And I think that will give a more realistic version of what should stay behind and what can move. And that's where OMB can then come in. And, you know, there will probably be some systems where, yeah, we got this one makes sense to move out. We'll have a general understanding that given time and cost and complexity, that one can move out. There'll probably be others that will say, you know what, you're going to have to work around those in the long term. And then there's some in the middle. And, 
and that will be the ones that OMB can focus on to, to figure out uh, accurate numbers. Good morning, Tom. Uh, Dan Lubar with the White Space Alliance. I, I just, because we're all sort of asleep this morning, I thought I'd... Uh, Did I do that? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're the uh, most lively thing in the room, in my opinion. But the, the point I was just uh, going to ask about, uh, the, uh, that bipartisan committee that the House has set up on uh, that Spectrum Working Group, I just want to get you to talk for a minute about, and leaving aside the fact it's election year, um, what, what do you think that'll look like? It looks like the Hill is getting more engaged and involved in spectrum policy issues. Love to hear your opinion on what that'll look like in the future. Yeah, I, I, um, we have not engaged with them yet. I think it's great. I think, uh, I think getting a group like that engaged and, and on the ground and, and uh, really digging into the facts can, can only be a good thing. But I, 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 we haven't engaged directly with them yet. I think they're still putting the pieces together, but we certainly look forward to working with them. Brown from could, with your discussions with the agencies, what would be incentives within their world to actually take a hard look at this and to think about the efficiency kinds of things that we all talk about forever? Yeah, it, I mean, this is it's something I've thought a lot about. It's really hard to come up with it. I mean, it's not like it's not like the agencies come to us and say, "Hey, if you do this, we'll do that." I mean, they're they all salute. They all say, "We're going to do it." Uh, but you know, as I said before, they they uh, uh, they have their missions to execute, and and uh, you know we're leaning on them to solve this problem while they're still just managing all their spectrum supported systems, whatever new investments that takes, the refinements, you know, investing in new hardware and software, you know, and then we ask them to then start thinking about relocating all that. Um, I, you know, I, I, this is my personal view. Is, is what I said before. I mean, it's how does it work in the private sector? It's like it's bonuses, right? Isn't that how we do it? Um, it's, it, it is, I, I, you know, I don't mean to suggest that we're going to be able to revamp the way federal budgets are done uh, or the way employees are compensated. But uh, uh, you know, I, I do think it's a pretty simple. I, I think uh, industry sometimes has the luxury of working in the free market, um, which probably sounds a little backwards to those of you who have to work in the free market. But uh, it does kind of lend a certain simplicity and a certain direction to, to what you do. And uh, you know, agencies are, and the government is often criticized for not uh, thinking enough like um, uh, the way business works. But there are, there are actually a lot of people who do. It's just that you know, we don't create incentives for them the way we do on the commercial side. I, I, I welcome people's attempts to try to solve this. Question right here. Yeah, my name is Bob Martin. I'm with the <coughs> Alliance Science Technology. Um, one of the issues that occurs to me is that in the discussion of relocation of federal operations, um, I think many of them don't think of it in terms of money, whether the price tag is big or small, is that they have a functionality they need to continue to support. And it's often at a piece of spectrum that supports that activity. To move, you need comparable spectrum. You can't take something from 1.5 gigahertz and put it at eight and have it work the same way. The, the bands that are comparable are uh, very limited for those agencies below three gigahertz. You, many of them see comparable spectrum as a principal issue here. You didn't mention that. Would you like to talk about that as an issue for relocation? In terms of the need for comparability? Well, spectrum that allows you to perform those same spectrum dependent activities for those same kind of platforms, for example. Yeah, no, it's, it's that, you know, particularly as you said, below the three uh, level, it's, uh, there, there is not a lot left. And, uh, and that's why, you know, these other solutions in terms of uh, whether it's, you know, small cells or smart antennas or, or those kind of things would have to be part of it. And looking for uh, non spectrum ways to serve the purpose. But yeah, I mean, it, just, that's, that's the, the crunch I think we're dealing with is there's, there's, it's interesting. It's limited spectrum, and we think of it as a finite resource, even though it's infinitely renewable. Um, but uh, uh, the comparability is key. Now, I will say that the legislation uh, that guides us here talks about uh, comparable um, capabilities, not comparable spectrum. Um, so, you know, we are always looking for non-spectrum ways to try to serve the mission. But for a lot of these, you know, satellites and and, and 
uh, Defense Department jets, that's not going to be a solution unless you've got a really long cable. Question over here. I am a TC Sadek. I'm a reporter with The Verge. Um, I'm just curious, uh, is there anything that prevents the government, or if there is, what is it, uh, that from asking carriers for regular audits of their spectrum util utilization to prove efficiency in a transparent manner? Um, you know, it's it really, on the commercial side, more of an FCC issue. I think, you know, our, our clearly the, the beginning point is to assume that that the markets take care of that, that through spectrum auctions you end up uh, uh, finding folks who will put the spectrum to its highest and best use and that they are essentially penalized in opportunity cost uh, if they don't do that. But I, you know, in terms of anything more specific than that, I'd have to defer to the folks at the commission. I think we've got time for one more question, then we're going to leave final word to uh, Tom. Uh, hey, Eliza Craig with Politico. Uh, that, that was a good question. Uh, I'll do a follow-up. Uh, so it may not be in your control, but do you think that's a good idea? Let's let's uh, be real here. There's an ongoing discussion about how we should have a spectrum inventory. I mean, you have former FCC uh, Commissioner Michael Kopp saying on uh, the communicators recently that he's sure there's fallow spectrum out there, and that's a common theme among people in this industry. So do you think that the FCC should do more enforcement efforts to make sure that, I mean, they're, they're their licenses. It's, not, it's government property that it's being used efficiently. Uh, I, you know, I, I really don't have anything to add to what I just said. I, I uh, you know, again, the starting point has been that auctions are the way to, uh, to solve this. I think uh, uh, we all agree with that. that. You know, there's certainly situations where the marketplace, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't work perfectly, but uh, and then the commission can step in. But I really have to leave that to the to the commission. Okay, Tom. Final word. There was a couple uh, mentions of a spectrum joke. So if you could, so be sure uh, to yeah, enliven actually, people. Uh, uh, last weekend I was telling about uh, the rose garden. I then left to go to a wedding. Okay. Uh, actually, it was uh, two antennas got married. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the ceremony was okay, but the reception was perfect. <laughs> Tom, thank you very, very much for sharing your time with us today. We really do appreciate it. Uh, the special iPad. The, the special iPad goes with you. We could raffle it off as a gift, I guess. Uh, okay, we should transition to the panel, and as they are coming up, I will, I will uh, filibuster and offer a couple of uh, remarks. Uh, the, the title of today's event is Spectrum Policy, Emerging Issues at an Inflection Moment, and Tom, the, the word that I got most excited about in creating that title was the word inflection or inflection moment. And, and Tom very graciously picked up on that. I think we really are at an inflection moment. Uh, we know that with the initial passage of the na and, and advance of the National Broadband Act and the 500 megahertz goal, a lot of very visible attention, a lot of very visible attention went to getting the legislative authority for incentive auctions. A much less visible effort was uh, undertaken, and as Tom described, by the administration. Uh, other efforts uh, exist, things like secondary markets, in which you can move or conceive of moving low-valued spectrum to high-valued uses. The panel that we are just about to, panel discussion that we're just about to embark on is a discussion of that panoply of, of issues. And I'm very, very excited about having a tremendous set of experts in the room to have that discussion. The first, I'll introduce them uh, each prior to their, their individual remarks, and we'll take a few Q&As uh, uh, right after each speaker, and then we'll open up to a more general discussion. The first speaker is, uh, is Professor Michael Katz. Michael is the Saren Chair of Strategy and Leadership at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he has been a longtime student of not only telecommunications policy, but competition policy. He's written prolifically uh, in, the, in these areas in an academic domain. And what is really, uh, I think, a compliment to his versatility is that he 
feels also comfortable contributing in a policy domain. He has been the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust at uh, the Department of Justice and has served a, as a, uh, the Chief Economist for the Federal Communications Commission. So he's contributed both to the academic domain and the policy domain. He's an absolutely lucid uh, uh, voice for bringing good, solid, and sometimes complex economics uh, through the policy filter, which sometimes requires just a simple clarity. And, and so we are just delighted to have Michael here. I will tell you that he's had a very uh, busy travel schedule. He was in Finland earlier this week, and I think he flew right over Washington to back to California and then came graciously agreed to come back to join us. So please help me welcome Professor Michael Katz. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here with so many familiar faces. If only I knew the names that went with them. <laughs> now, let's see. If, uh, well, I've accomplished my main goal, which I did manage to get my presentation on the screen. Um, so I'm going to, as it says, talk about auction set-asides. There's been a, a big debate about it. Um, and so I'm going to go through very briefly sort of my views on this. Now, let's see if I can. Uh, OK. Well, let's just start with a review of what um, Spectrum license auctions have accomplished, or they've done. And there's three sources of benefits. Much as it pains me as an economist, I will put money first. Um, I still remember I was chief economist at the FCC during the, um, the initial PCS auctions. I remember driving over with then Chairman Reed Hunt um, when he was going to go make an announcement at the auction. When the auction sites, I said, look, don't go on about the money. You should go on about how it's promoting allocative efficiency and how well it's working because, you know, the FCC really didn't create the resource. They're not really responsible for the money. Okay, that was sort of the uh, technocratic and very naive and stupid side of me. And I said, and also, just to be careful, some other auctions, you know, might not go as well as people expect and you, want to, you don't want to take the blame. So he said, yeah, that's all good advice. And he sort of got out of the car, a microphone went in his face. He goes, look at all that money the FCC made. Okay, so we'll start with that one. But the fact of the matter is auctions have raised billions and have the prospect of raising billions more. And I should say one thing on that on behalf of economists, and in particular, doing it in an efficient way, right? Because it's not, we're not talking about it being a tax. It can substitute for tax revenues at the Treasury, but it is putting a price on a scarce resource um, that should be priced. Okay, another thing is, you know, a real virtue of them is they've sped up the assignment process. Those of you who are old enough to remember, the, you know, the good old days of lotteries and beauty contests, um, could, things could drag on forever. And related to that, Right. Also, the other processes, there's no guarantee that they would get you to the um, best use of the spectrum. Now, it's been pointed out, and, and I will agree with that, that there's no guarantee that an auction gets into what's the highest social value use. Okay? And so if your standard is to take a realistic view of auctions and an idealized view of alternative processes, such as the government allocating through a beauty contest, the idealized beauty contest will win. Okay. But I think the right comparison right, is a realistic view of auctions and a realistic view of the alternative assignment mechanisms. And I think there it's pretty clear that the auctions have um, done a better job. Okay. Now, I also think that having a process of license set-asides, and in particular, what are the ones we're talking about? The, now, as I understand it, the main thing on the table is to try to block some or all incumbents you know, if the sum would be blocking the largest incumbents from bidding at auction. And what I'll talk about very briefly this morning is why I think that that's a bad policy and why it threatens, you know, the benefits in terms of the revenues, in terms of the speed of the um, process, and also threatens getting the spectrum to the highest value use. Okay, in terms of the um, revenues, I mean, the, the simple point of it is that the incumbent carriers, and particularly the largest ones, which have been the most successful in terms of providing the services that consumers value, and thus have the greatest need for spectrum, the, those carriers, the ones who are very likely those who would be willing to bid the most, or among those who would bid the most, okay, there's certainly other firms, you know, Apple or Google decided they want to bid on licenses. They certainly have the resources and they have a lot of the expertise and related um, knowledge. But it's pretty clear that the largest incumbents would be among the leading bidders, and taking leading bidders out of an auction 
um, threatens the revenues. Now, I will come back to an offsetting argument that's sometimes made in just a few minutes. Okay, let me start with that one. Okay, second one is that if you look at um, past set-aside programs, if, I won't go through the history of uh, Next Wave. This is not a, an unhappy story for almost everyone. And then similar things have happened in other countries as well, though that what's often happened is the beneficiaries of set-asides have turned out not to be capable um, of actually having the businesses, that things have ended up getting tied up in the courts for years. And it, you know, in the case of Next Wave and others, it was almost a decade before the spectrum was actually put to use, which you know, really isn't good for anybody except for economic consultants and uh, litigating attorneys. And those are both very deserving groups, or at least one of those two is. But there's more to the economy than that. Um, so I mean, that's a problem. Again, okay, it's, it's initially what. And then, of course, the last one is that I would say that you don't get to the highest value use. Now, of course, some people are going to disagree with that. They say, no, no, we're picking you know, the set aside precisely to get it to the highest value use because we think the market process will give us the wrong answer. And again, that's something to um, come back to. And I would disagree with that. I think that while the market doesn't work perfectly, it's the best we've got going and that no other process is going to work better. So what I want to do is, having said, OK, auctions have done these good things, they're threatened, I want to address um, some of the counter arguments that have been made to that, starting with probably this last view that says, well, look, you can't count on spectrum auctions doing the right thing. They won't lead to a competitive outcome. So what we need to do is use set-asides to handicap the most successful incumbents in order to create competition. OK, and what I put up here is you know, my view, which of course, I think it's the correct view, is that rather than creating competition, set-asides would distort it, OK? Because if you think about what set-asides are about at one level, if you're going to target them at the largest, most successful incumbents, what you're saying is those firms that have done the best job in satisfying consumer demands, or at least as perceived by consumers, right, are the ones you're going to make it hard for them to expand. Now, what does it mean to be hard to expand? Well, if you have less spectrum and you have significant demand, that's going to result in your having higher marginal costs. Right? It's going to be harder for you to expand to attract additional customers because given the spectrum constraints you face, you're going to have to do things like split macro cells. You're going to have to adopt micro cell um, technologies. Or you can also switch to different technologies, such as moving to LTE. But all of those things are expensive, and particularly when you talk about macro cell splitting and adding more and more micro cells, they can become increasingly expensive, both because of the propagation characteristics and just the capital investment needed, and also because you're going to have to deal with um, local governments and zoning. OK, well, what's the result of that? Okay, if you drive up a carrier's marginal cost, and this should not be controversial. It's actually a rather surprising, well, it's not surprising to me at all. It's disappointing to me that there are people who think that somehow having higher marginal costs would not make a difference to a firm because it's an evil monopolist. Okay, That's pretty much like saying monopolists are evil because when their costs go up, they don't pass those costs on to consumers. Okay, Presumably, the, the evil monopoly people are not saying that. A monopolist would raise, the, if its marginal costs go up, you would expect it to raise its prices. That's also true of firms that are not monopolists. I mean, it should be an uncontroversial statement that generally, we have a bunch of firms, you know, firms with downward sloping demand curves, their costs go up. That makes it less attractive for them to try and get additional consumers, which means they're either going to charge higher prices or have lower quality than otherwise. So the bottom line is this is not just about the, you know, the welfare of the carriers. It's about consumer welfare. And making it harder and more expensive for carriers to expand is going to hurt consumers. Okay? It's going to hurt consumers. You see about the broader effects. It's going to hurt consumers directly. You know, as purchasers of these services, and it will also hurt consumers indirectly in terms of if you're consuming a service that itself relies on wireless services. Okay, so it could hurt you in terms of you know certainly if you want to do something like download mobile videos and stuff, and that you're actually going to be be harmed as a consumer of those services because they may be stunted. Now, these broader adverse effects, you might think, oh, look, that's tiny. You know, How much is a law firm going to charge more because their uh, cell service is more expensive? And any one effect really could be tiny. But if you start aggregating this up across the entire economy, all of a sudden, it's real money. Now, the other thing I want to note is this a point, point applies more generally about handicapping. Right? There's, I think, a pretty 
in certain circles, a widespread sentiment for saying we need to do something. I mean, let's just put it on the table. There are a lot of people out to stop AT&T and Verizon from getting bigger. Now, if what you're talking about is they're getting bigger through mergers, certainly I agree that the appropriate thing to do is conduct antitrust review and, and um, look at the, you know, the mergers and assess whether they're pro or anti-competitive. But if the goal really is to say, look, they just shouldn't be bigger, let's try to you know, prevent them from getting the resources that would need to get bigger, I think that's just completely misguided. I mean, it really is saying, in those cases where consumers you know, are voting with their feet, where they would like to buy more of a service, it's saying, well, we've decided consumers are making the wrong decision, and we want to make it harder for, cons for firms to meet their demands. Okay. Now, let me come back to what was the first point on the benefits, and that's the revenues. You know, some people have advocated um, set-asides as a way to increase auction revenues. Now, first off, I think it's bad because they could lower them. Okay, from the reason I mentioned at the beginning, that you've got, you're taking out some of the highest potential bidders, and that's generally going to depress auction revenues. But it is the case, it's true, that it's, there's a possibility that using set-asides in the right way, you could raise auction revenues. And basically what you would do, if you again think about attacking the largest incumbents, is you'd say to them, okay, you could, you know, we're going to put all of you in a room, and you can only bid on a small amount of spectrum, and you're going to go after each other, and you're going to drive the price way up. Basically, it's saying to the government, act as a discriminating monopolist. Okay? Try to um, restrict the supply of spectrum to a set of the highest value bidders to see if you can push them to drive their bids even higher than otherwise. And in theory, under some, you know, for some parameter values and such, that could work. Okay? But if you think about how it's working, again, what it's relying on basically is acting like a monopolist, which right, generally um, we're opposed to and we're opposed to for good reason. And it's having the government drive up the prices again of those carriers that are most successful in um, serving consumers. And so the effect of that, even if it does raise revenues, is going to be raising them in a way that harms consumers. Okay, and let me point out that's different than what happens in auctions overall. Sure, there's a sense you might think, well, wouldn't consumers be better off than if we had no auctions, the spectrum were just free? Well, no, because the spectrum has to go somewhere. And in fact, using the price system is, is a good way Certainly, you know, as they say, the best way we have practically is a good way to, as, to assign the um, spectrum. If you start moving to discriminatory auctions and discriminatory pricing, then you're undermining that benefit of alloca or, or, or allocate in the economic sense of the term, assign um, weekly. You're, you're undermining the benefits of auctions for efficient assignment. Okay? And then, Lastly, let me talk about warehousing, because that's the other reason that's been given. In terms of the theory, it said, well, look, you know, the, the argument would be, well, it's fine. You know, markets often work well, the argument would go, and it would send things to the highest value, but you know, there can be a difference between social value and private value, and proponents of the warehousing theory are concerned. They say, well, what's really going on is the largest incumbents are trying to sit on the spectrum and just keep others from having it. And it's true, the value to them is very high, but the value is not that they're getting the spectrum to serve consumers, the value is they're blocking competitors. Mm -hmm. So that would be the theory, and one of the predictions of the theory, I guess, is that the larger you are as an incumbent, um, the more you um, do this. And I would say, I think that generally, the facts um, don't support it. The biggest thing I would point to, and actually can even anticipate a question coming since there's those earlier ones asked about, well, you know, is our carriers using this stuff efficiently or is, you know, the spectrum crunch an illusion? I think the most telling fact, and that's when we just focus on that one, is that the largest providers spend a lot of money increasing their capacity. Now, not all of their network investment is for capacity. Some of it is um, to improve quality. There's, you know, coverage builds. But my understanding from talking to them, is they're and look in their financial statements, they're spending billions of dollars a year increasing their capacity. Okay, and of course they're doing that because the traffic volumes are going way up. If you really just wanted to sit on this stuff, you wouldn't be making those investments. Right? Again, I mean, think about LTE. We think about it as something that can bring much higher speeds, and it's an improvement in quality. But another big feature of LTE is it's much more spectrally efficient than the 3G technologies. So my view is, if you look at it, that the, the facts just don't fit the warehousing theory. Now, you could tell stories about almost all of these things and twist them to make them consistent 
with warehousing. But then the question is, OK, but, but where is really convincing evidence of warehousing as opposed to any counter evidence you can try to undermine? And I certainly in my case, I have not seen any evidence um, that people could point to that I think holds up at all as evidence of warehousing. One thing people like to point to is say, well, in their spectrum, that's not being used right now. My understanding is, yes, there is. That's not evidence of warehousing, because in fact, you need to do um, capacity planning, and you've got to plan things long term. There's nothing wrong with this. Now, the, I guess maybe, though, it's not on the slide, but I'll finish by saying I think the biggest objection I'd have to the warehousing theory as a basis for um, license set aside is there's a lot better ways to go after this, and namely antitrust. And I will say, and I've been at both agencies, both the FCC and DOJ, and I think that's something the responsibility should lie squarely with the Department of Justice, not the FCC. Um, I think, and it pains me a bit having been at both, but the DOJ, I think, clearly is a more appropriate antitrust agency and that it can look into this. I mean, there are antitrust laws that govern e exclusionary behavior, and if one thinks this truly is exclusionary behavior, then prove it, okay? And so I would say that's one thing. The second one I would say is, if you're concerned about warehousing, the other thing to do is just keep working to get more and more spectrum out there, because of course the more spectrum out there, the harder and the more uneconomic it is um, to engage in warehousing. Thank you. Michael has agreed to take some questions. Uh, again, if you would, we've got microphones that can come around. If you'll just simply raise your hand and then identify yourself so that we know who you are. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'll give up. Questions? Remember that. Remember, I said this was audience participation, and, and in my classes at Georgetown, I will call on people. So stand. Uh, just uh, I, I, and I know many of you. I will call on you. So please feel free to ask a question. And I only know one spectrum joke, and I just heard it. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for the free for all. Okay, well, why don't we then uh, move to Anna Marie Kovacs. Let me introduce Anna Marie. Uh, she is currently serving as a visiting senior policy scholar at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Uh, and prior to that time, she for many years was, uh, you will know, many of you in this room will know, that she was perhaps the leading uh, financial analyst in the country focusing on telecommunications policy, the role of regulation, the role of federal legislation on affecting um, investment uh, in the industry, on affecting uh, the shifting shares of consumers and, and uh, across the various vendors. Uh, she was a voice that many, many people in this room and, and in Wall Street looked to, to, uh, to get a sense of the impacts of regulation on the investment community. Now, are we ready? Okay. So uh, without further ado, Anna Marie Kovacs. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for... Uh for the opportunity to participate here. Um, what I'm doing is really just giving you a case study to talk about some of the same issues that Michael talked about. And having not seen this paper this morning, I'm glad to see we are more or less aligned, which is always a good thing. Um, to me, what is really interesting um, about auction 73, which was the 700 megahertz auction, is that it provides a wonderful case study of the two big issues that are around the wireless side of the incentive auctions. One is the issue of who should be part allowed to participate, and the other is uh, what happens when you impose conditions. And so I took a look at what happened in auction 73, where, where uh, those things come up. 
Um, well, this is not moving, so. Sorry, it did. Doing, there's a split screen so you can actually see what's coming. Thank you, you can't Michael. See what's happening. I can't even do simple technology. <laughs> We've really complicated this. All right. So uh, the first point I guess I want to make is that by any sort of reasonable normal standard, if you look at the wireless industry, it is in fact extremely competitive. Uh, almost 100% of the U.S. population, 99.8%, and these statistics are out of the FCC's uh, wireless competition report, the last one, the 15th. Uh, wireless covers nearly 100% of the population, 99% have access to at least two providers, and all, just about 90% have access to five or more providers. For mo mobile broadband, uh, coverage is 98.5%. Uh, of the U.S. population, 92% have access to at least two providers, and just under 70% have access to four providers of mobile broadband. S the only areas where there really is anything of an issue are the really low-density rural areas. So I think as we look at the issue of do we need to ration spectrum in any way, whether it's through set-asides or, or through spectrum aggregation screens, whatever, one of the things we do want to keep in mind is that, in fact, it is a highly competitive industry to begin with. Um, I don't think it's um, any, oops, any secret that this is a very rapidly growing industry, and the, Tom referred to it earlier. Uh, the statistics that come out, in, in this case, out of Cisco study are pretty widely known. The expectation is that U.S. data traffic between 2010 and 2015 is expected to grow by a factor of 21 times, with the major driver being video. So again, the issue of getting a lot of spectrum out into the hands of consumers through their carriers is a tremendously important issue. The um, point that Michael alluded to um, briefly, I'm making in a little bit more detail, which is that the industry is doing a tremendous amount to use the spectrum in its hands efficiently. Um, these numbers are from 2010. The, the number is not very different in 2011. The wireless industry spent about $26 billion on capital expenditures. Um, that includes everything from rolling out LTE, building new cell sites, implementing all the technologies that Tom referred to that are actually in the marketplace right now and working on developing ones that are not in the marketplace yet from uh, fiber backhaul to increase the capacity of cell sites or to better transport what is coming through cell sites to implementing distributed antennas, uh, femtocells, all, all the rest of that. So again, I think it is important to understand that while there are things that can be done through investment to optimize the use of the spectrum that is out there, there are limits to that, and the industry is doing everything it can to be operating at, at the utmost efficiency. Um, all of this was recognized by Congress, I guess, and the result of that was the spectrum portion of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, which does provide um, opportunities to recapture spectrum, whether from the broadcasters or the government, which is what Tom was talking about earlier, and then use the spectrum that comes in to raise some funds um, and use those funds for a combination of funding the uh, public safety network as well as um, for funding uh, deficit reduction. But to me, looking at it from the perspective of consumers, the most important thing it does is create the groundwork for bringing a lot of spectrum into the marketplace so that it will be available for consumers. And it seems to me that what's key in, for consumers out of this act 
is to maximize the spectrum that, we, that is recaptured. In other words, think about incentives for broadcasters to uh, sell their spectrum, worry more about getting it back from them for efficient use than about issues like windfall. Um, it is important to get auctions going quickly and to provide incentives to those who buy the spectrum to get uh, the spectrum into use quickly. And then obviously to make sure that the people who get the spectrum are the ones who are going to be able to invest in order to maximize its use. Um, the next few slides refer to auction 73. And it seems to me that there were several very important lessons out of that auction. One of them was that small players actually did amazingly well in auction 73. And before going into that, I think we need to think about who did and did not participate. Two of the major players, Sprint and T-Mobile, uh, for whatever reason, chose not to participate at all. So uh, two companies, wireless providers, who at the time had 32% of the subscriber base sat out the auction. The reason I bring up this point is that what it tells me is that you can't really try and plan an auction around parties who may not show up. You have, as the FCC, you really have no control over who will show up. And so all you can do is open the door wide, hope that everyone does come, but make sure that you've laid the groundwork for something that's going to operate efficiently, no matter who actually chooses to participate. Um, and there were other examples as well in that auction. The uh, most striking one in terms of a company that in this case very badly wanted to participate but couldn't, Frontline wanted to buy the uh, D block, but the economy fell apart sh shortly between the time when the rules were written and the time when the auction began, and they were not able to get funding. And so the D block, which had been written whose rules had been written largely on the assumption the front line would be there to bid and to work with public safety, was unable to participate. So with all of that as background, what I'd like to say that in spite of the bad economy, in spite of companies that the FCC no doubt hoped would participate didn't, um, the auction actually had 214 qualified bidders. It had 101 winners. and. Um, the small players who represented 10% of the subscriber base wound up winning 28% of the spectrum, and they only paid 14% of the total proceeds. So the important points to me here are several. One, it is possible for the small guys to get in there, and there were on the A block, which um, there were sorry, my notes on this one are on another slide. There were 25 winners on the A block. There were 52 winners on the B block. There were only three winners on the C block, none for D, and then five for the E block. But again, the two key points here are they came, they came in, they were able to win a lot, they were able to win a lot at prices they could afford, um, and actually, as far as I can tell from looking at these statistics, wound up doing a lot better than AT&T, which represented 27% of the subscribers, but only won 14% of the spectrum. Um, and that, in some ways, is uh, particularly, I guess, unfortunate from their perspective, certainly, or their subscribers, because when you look at who among the companies has how much spectrum. The um, largest carriers, AT&T and Verizon, each have roughly 60% of the industry average. Uh, T-Mobile, and this is including, I included in these statistics, the transfer from AT&T to T-Mobile at, at, that resulted out of, of their 
failed attempted merger. T-Mobile winds up, has wound up with somewhat above the average, um, and Clearwire is sitting obviously on a huge amount of spectrum depending on how you look at their relationship with Sprint. Uh, that combination has more than twice the average. Um, and this statistic matters because of the point that Michael raised, which is the more spectrum you have, the better you can serve your customers, the mo more you're able to do it uh, at reasonable cost and therefore to contain prices. Conversely, uh, being spectrum starved winds up with higher prices and, and restrictions on usage. One of the interesting points to me from auction 73 is what happens when you impose conditions. So the prior slides related to participation. This one um, relates to the impact that conditions can have on prices, and the slides have two lines. And let me begin by saying that I agree with what Tom said earlier uh, and what I, I'm sure Michael, having been at the FCC fields as well, it is very much an expert agency and does have tremendous expertise. Nevertheless, in this instance, they radically uh, mispredicted the valuations that were going to result in the auctions. The um, darker line on the left in each column in each case is the price per megahertz pop that the FCC predicted. The lighter line is what they actually got. Um, if you look at it, they predicted that the highest valuation would be coming in for uh, the A block at 55 cents, uh, excuse me, for the C block at 74 cents, and then for the A block at 55. In fact, the and the lowest valuation they had was for the B block at 41 cents per megahertz pop. As it turned out, the A block, um, like the B block, had no conditions attached, but the A block had interference issues from uh, broadcast channel 51. And so the A block's valuation, while higher than the FCC predicted, did not skyrocket. The B block, which had no interference and also had no conditions attached, wound up bringing in $2.68 instead of 41 cents per megahertz pop. And that was by far uh, almost a factor of four times the valuation on the next <coughs> highest spectrum block. The C block, which had the open access condition, which effectively had only Verizon bidding for it, wound up going for, as I said, about a quarter of what the B block did, which was great for Verizon. Um, but there was no, no inherent reason in terms of the spectrum. It was unencumbered, it was national, it should have been enormously desirable, and yet it wound up bringing in far less um, than the B block. So to me, looking at the numbers from this auction, it is very clear that putting on onerous conditions that are not sort of the normal, yes, whoever buys has to have you know, normal operating, financial, character, whatever sort of uh, requirements, but going beyond that, I think, winds up resulting in major distortions of the market. So my final point, and this is one uh, Michael made as well, is that you really need to think about the issue of spectrum rationing from the perspective of the consumer and think about whether it actually is really helpful. I think folks who talk about set-asides have this sort of well-intentioned idea that if you just wind up keeping the big guys out of the game and you make spectrum very cheap and you give it to new entrants or the smaller existing entrants, somehow you're going to get all of well, not all, but a lot of the big guys' customers 
to go over and you, to the new guys and you're going to have this wonderful sort of competitive nirvana. I think there are, it's not impossible, but it doesn't strike me after nearly three decades of looking at companies as something that's actually very realistic. I think what happens is the large companies, because they are spectrum deprived, do wind up having to ration spectrum to their users, their quality deteriorates, their prices go up. What that does for the smaller winners, uh, if they are even able to actually operate, if you don't wind up in the next wave kind of situation, but let's say they actually get up and going, they look around and there's this you know, price umbrella that they have no particular reason to operate much below. So their customers, they don't have a lot of incentive to provide their customers with lower prices or better service um, because they're not getting a standard that's better being set by the larger companies. So bottom line, both in terms of what the auctions can do for public safety and treasury, in terms of uh, the money they can bring in, but also in terms of what they can do for consumers, it seems to me that open auctions, neutral auctions, that welcome all bidders and do so without um, any uh, attempt to sort of skew the market, that those are, are really the best. So the bottom line is maximize uh, participation, try and get everyone to participate, but let leave the door open for everyone. In a situation like that, auction 73 shows that uh, small players can win, and particularly if you do provide a variety of geographic areas for them to play with, and then just avoid onerous conditions to maximize proceeds. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. So again, uh, this is the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, Anna Maria has spoken from a, an historical perspective about the uh, revenue proceeds from the auction 773, which, which may be informative for spectrum policy design, auction design going forward. I think we have a question right in the middle of the room. And let me go ahead and open it up to questions that might go both to Anna Maria and Michael. We're going to replow that. Uh, Philip Weber, Congressional Budget Office. It's just a factual question. You didn't say anything on it. It was one of your slides, and I just wish you would have uh, thing. You said the wireless carriers accounted for 25% of all ICT investment in 2010. That seems like a very big share. Um. I'm sorry, I need to actually go back and look at that. Um, but yes, that is my understanding. Question right here. Uh, Bob Martin with Alliance Science and Technology. Um, I'm curious. It was CapEx as percent of CapEx. Go ahead, Bob. I'm um, sorry. In regards to either uh, panelists, uh, on potential restrictions on future auctions, it seems like spectrum demand is, is in large part driven by offered traffic, which is associated with, with population densities. And so one thought is you can put more spectrum out there to a degree, but when you take it away, as Mr. Power pointed out, someone has to get out. And if it's driven by population centers, do you see any future or value, or what would you think about a notion of putting spectrum out there that was focused around, say, the top 200 metropolitan areas where the demand might be greater and the rural areas that already clearly have enough spectrum to support the, the uh, population and the offered traffic in the rural areas, that people there who use the services in that spectrum wouldn't necessarily be dislocated to the point that it made earlier about how difficult it is to clear spectrum for an auction. Does that make sense? <laughs> I think you clearly have different issues in rural areas than you do in urban areas in the sense that, um, for example, you need different kinds of cell sites, different technologies work, different ways of enhancing the technologies work. 
um, to some extent, you can use somewhat different timelines. But you know, it, it, part of the issue is going to be what sort of legal framework are you working within, and how much flexibility is there. So, I, as I would say, if, if the, a summary, a fair summary of your question is, would it make sense to? Um, target the clearing or sh sharing efforts, whatever, with federal users in the places where there's the highest demand, which typically is the densest areas, I would say yes. The only questions I think that would come up is, you know, and Maria is saying is, are there things sort of legal issues that somehow cut across geographic areas, or is there some reason, you know, are there technological issues that you have some sort of integrated network nationally? But to the extent that they're localized uses, I think it would make complete sense to focus on the places where there's the um, most or, scarcity. I mean, to put it another way, I would certainly not be holding up the other auctions, the particularly the broadcast auction, to coordinate the timing with some of the federal clearing that could take a decade. I mean, the point is to get going as quickly as possible within whatever uh, legal options the FCC has. Just to follow up, is, it, is there your experience and sense that there's any currency to that notion in between carriers and commercial uh, service offers? Well, I mean, if you ask, my understanding certainly is that carriers are much more concerned about spectrum generally in urban areas. And I don't know um, if for some other reason they have a view on sort of, you know, localized clearing and sharing by federal users or not. But, but certainly their needs, as I understand them, are much more focused in urban areas. I mean, I don't know how the carriers look at it, but uh, the way I look at it is we've had a series of auctions over the years of various slices of spectrum, and I don't know why we couldn't do that over the next decade as well as, you know, again, given the restrictions, for example, the, the uh, reverse auction to recapture spectrum from the broadcasters can only be done once, so that certainly places a, a constraint. But... Um, you know, clearing federal spectrum separate on a different timeline and auctioning it on a different timeline, to me, having not having the operational issues of either the FCC or the companies, to me, that certainly makes sense. Let me let me maybe add one observation, and that is with respect to the urban and rural. I think your observations are are completely spot on in terms of the constraints in urban versus rural areas. But one point to slow down a little bit about is that if you look at the geographic demand for wireless telephony, it actually is relatively the, the sort of vanguard of the movement to the wireless arena is oftentimes in relatively low population density areas. So while the, the total demand for spectrum is, is very condensed in urban areas, New York, Washington, San Francisco, and so on, uh, consumers are not, it's not as though consumers aren't using the wireless technologies and sometimes moving very quickly to use them intensively in, in rural areas. So I just simply wanted to put that marker in the ground. But at the same time, if you look at how spectrum requirements are calculated, you start with population. So that's not to say that you, in rural environments you don't offer broadband services, but the core, the offered traffic is inherently smaller because there are fewer people. That's all that. Well, no, but, I, but just to pick up on John's point, but the mix of services people are consuming, you look at telecommunication services overall can be different. And I take it John's point is that if you get into a rural area, the most efficient way to provide very high capacity broadband that you might in an urban area provide over fiber, in a rural area you could be doing wireless so that even though the population density is much lower, there certainly could be a higher demand per capita. Now that said, my understanding still is that carriers face more pressures in urban areas today, but it's definitely a factor that has to be considered. But I think what you also want to keep in mind is that in urban areas, you can use smaller cell sites, for example, so higher frequencies are much more practical than they are in some rural areas. But in rural areas, you also have topography issues, I mean, the plains of Kansas are not the same as the mountains of Colorado. So I think we won't belabor this point much more. John's point that, yes, wireless is tremendously important to rural people uh, is very much to the point. But then beyond that, I think we're, we're really getting into the weeds. There was a hand. Jake, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes, 
My name is Jake Gramlich of Compass Lexicon. So, Michael, you talked a bit about one of the FCC's objectives for the Spectrum auctions being revenue raising. Mm -hmm. So do they need to consider the timing of when they sell Spectrum, given that presumably it's getting more valuable over time? So if they sell it too soon, does that just mean that the first buyer gets more of the revenue that the FCC could have gotten by, or, or how does or how should the yeah. FCC think about that issue? So I'm. Um, I would say they shouldn't think about it. I guess I'll leave it that way. I am certainly not going to get up here and claim the financial markets work perfectly. Um, I didn't believe it before 2008. I certainly don't believe it after, um, or what we're living through now. Um, but I just don't think the FCC should get in the, the business of trying to think whether or not, figure out whether the market is mispricing um, spectrum today or whether the FCC has a different discount rate than the market does. I think that really the um, the FCC and the federal government generally should just be sort of moving ahead with, you know, all due speed. And the, it's just asking them to do something that, A, I think is almost impossible to do, but B, they're really not set up to do. Taking that question from another angle, the law, the law gives them a decade to get it done, basically. So they, they do have the flexibility. Anna, uh, Dan Lubargan, uh, White Space Alliance. Just really quickly, because um, that one slide you had with the very large, uh, for the B block, megahertz pop number, uh, and it was very large. It was, what was it, two, two, two plus yeah. dollars? Yeah, almost uh, three, yeah. I just sort of wanted you to talk really briefly, because I know Scott's queued up here, um, about why you think FCC was so far off in, in that number. That was a pretty big disparity. Um, I think, I really think they did not understand the impact of the uh, open access condition on the C block, the impact that would have on uh, bidding on demand for the C block. Um, I think that was open spectrum. It was something that should have been extremely desirable. And because companies decided they weren't going to take on something with that kind of condition, this was, remember, before the open internet order, um, all of the, a lot of the demand was squeezed over into the B block, which, as uh, Commissioner McDowell has pointed out a couple of times recently, then, you know, sent a lot of the players over into the A block, um, from the B block to the A block as well, ones who were looking for smaller pieces of spectrum. So you've sort of got a concatenation of uh, carriers who weren't going to go for a national, who might have gone for B, wound up going for A, because carriers who were, would have otherwise gone for C, wound up going for B. So y you got a lot of distortion. Bottom line was, you know, still, as I said, the small players di did wind up doing extremely well. Um, but the total take out of the uh, auction, I think, was less than it could have been had the C block not had that particular condition. Yeah, sure. John Mansell, consultant. I'm wondering what the panel's take is on the prospective AWS and marketing deals between cable operators and Verizon. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat that? Yeah, sorry. Can you give us your take on the prospective spectrum and marketing deals between AWS, uh, excuse me, between the cable operators and Verizon? seems to me that Spectrum has been sitting fallow uh, in the hands of the cable operators um, who decided that they don't really have the business plan that they'd hoped they would have. And given that, uh, the best thing that could happen would be to get that Spectrum into use as quickly as possible. I think that's the best thing for consumers. So uh, my view certainly is that that deal should get done and should get done uh, as quickly as possible to get the spectrum into use. I'm pretty sure the, the financial an analysts, the investment community uh, generally looks at it that way. Good question in the back yeah. and then over here. Yeah, this is uh, Darren Milet. I'm with Adaptrum. Just a quick question on, you know, the spectrum inventories and why we haven't seen anything either from the regulators saying, look, we've done a comprehensive inventory. 
I can show how much Spectrum AT&T have here in DC, how much they use. Are they using it efficiently, meaning is 90% of the traffic going over a macro cell versus a small cell architecture? You know, why haven't we seen that data? Well, I think the FCC is trying to do uh, some of that with the Spectrum dashboard. Um, I don't know how easy it is to do that sort of on a constant dynamic basis, but I think that there are there is interest in that. There's certainly interest longer term, and this is maybe the right segue to Scott, uh, in looking at secondary markets um, and how secondary markets could make efficient use on a constant dynamic basis uh, with subleasing of whatever is not being used at a particular time. Um, the um, act that Congress just passed makes some provision for uh, use by uh, public safety of commercial spectrum when there is an emergency, and conversely, uh, for allowing uh, commercial use of public safety spectrum when that is sitting fallow. So there is, and, and obviously one of the things that the NTIA is talking about in the context of the 95 megahertz that they have identified is some version of spectrum sharing. So the, the, I know this is something you've been doing for a long time, but it certainly is something that's gaining a lot of traction to see uh, how the technological issues that arise in terms of interference can be overcome um, in order to allow sharing. So I'm gonna like to say a couple of things about the notion of the inventory. So uh, fine, like the license inventory we already have, um, I assume it works. So it seems like the, the issue or the controversial part is having some notion of use and efficiency. And I would say, my view is that having the FCC try to do that is largely misguided. Um, I think it will end up being highly politicized. It will almost certainly be wrong. And the second part, through no fault of the commissions. But it's quite a difficult issue to know what it means to use spectrum efficiently. There are people who seem to think it means something like how many bits you're getting per second or something per megahertz um, and without any regard for the cost, which is, I mean, it's just the wrong measure. Otherwise, what you should do is go to very high frequencies, have microcells on the order of a foot or two apart, and there's essentially unlimited spectrum, and there's no reason to be complaining about any of this. So if that's your measure, you can say, oh, we'll just declare victory and go home. So, I mean, an appropriate measure of efficiency has to take into account the other costs associated um, with the network, also has to take into account the traffic patterns and everything else, right? I mean, often, or, you know, here certainly carries will say that they have to build to the peaks. Now, that's not to say that, you know, well, as long as you're using it at peak, it's efficient. Because obviously there's a question, what happens off peak? There are questions about sharing. There, I would say, a more productive place, I think, to look, rather than trying to look over the shoulders of various license holders and say, are you using it enough, would be to look at secondary markets and ask, what are the obstacles to secondary markets of functioning more effectively? Because I think that is something where there's a fairly broad consensus that secondary markets generally have not been smoothly functioning. And I think a lot of economists would be disappointed in them. So I would look there rather than try to decide to um, to do our own network engineering, decide if we're happy the way people with really massive networks are using them. Let, let me say that we have time for two quick questions and answers, then I want to move to our third panelist, please. Uh, this is TC with The Verge. Um, do you feel that the usefulness of the A and B blocks is limited by the lack of interoperability, and should the FCC step in and require it as the smaller carriers have been asking? I don't have a tech view on the tech end. So. Um, I think the main issue with the A block has really been the interference from broadcast. So I think I don't think the issue you're raising is really the key issue in terms of, of the inability to use the A block effectively. And I don't think there's really an issue on the B block. So I think, you know, whether this winds up getting solved through this next set of, of broadcast auctions or not, whether some of those broadcasters are going to be willing to give up their spectrum, who knows? Yeah, I would just say one thing on the, I mean, the interoperability, I have to look at the details, but 
if you are going to look at that, I mean, you do need to think about what the costs of imposing the interoperability are and also whether or not you're talking about national ecosystems or global ecosystems for a lot of these things. And my understanding is that most of the ecosystem, in fact, are global. And so various points that I've seen, and I haven't been directly in the debate, made about scale, I think, are sometimes misplaced because they're looking at the, the wrong level. Could you give us a brief indication of how much of the uh, spectrum auction at, at uh, auction 73 is in uh, productive use, as Michael put it? It's, it's going the same direction, I'd say. Um, the spectrum became available, um, the auction was in 2008. We went through the DTV transition afterwards. So for all practical purposes, the spectrum really became available or in late 2009, 2010. Someone correct me if I'm misremembering. Um, what you ha are seeing now is the rollout of LTE over that spectrum by Verizon pretty much throughout the country by the end of, uh, of the year. Some parts left into next year, but almost entirely. Uh, you're seeing AT&T roll out LTE very aggressively. Um, also, finishing that by the end of next year, you're seeing some of the small players doing a rollout. So I would say, given any kind of reasonable expectations in terms of when the network was, when the spectrum came into uh, the operator's hands, normal planning cycles, when the technologies, when the handsets, all of the rest of that became available. Um, I would say you've got actually a stunningly high and use coming on very quickly because what you've had here is a whole technology transition going along with, with that spectrum. Let's move now to our third panelist. Uh, and before I do, let me mention that at this time it's a good uh, point to uh, put a note in the, to you that uh, Michael's remarks and Anna Marie's remarks and, and to some extent uh, Scott Walston's remarks uh, are captured in, in papers that are available to you uh, just outside the door. Uh, Michael's entitled An Economic Analysis of Auction Set-Asides. Anna Maria's entitled Neutral Spectrum Auctions, Maximizing Proceeds and Consumer Benefits, in a paper that uh, Scott Walston and I did entitled Secondary Markets, The Quiet Economic Value Creator. Uh, that brings us to Scott Walston, uh, who I'm delighted to introduce. Scott is the Vice President for Research for, for uh, Technology Policy Institute. He is also a Senior Policy Fellow at Georgetown Center for Business and uh, Public Policy and is a lecturer for Stanford University uh, Public Policy. Uh, he is a, a frequent and prolific uh, contributor both in writing and in uh, speaking about these issues. So we're really glad to have Scott here. The charge to Scott has been to comment on and to elaborate on the remarks of Professor Katz and Anna Maria uh, Kovacs and then to uh, offer his own reflections in this area. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, John. Um, so like John said, I'm not, uh, I'm not actually presenting a paper, although I encourage you to read the one John and I, uh, John and I wrote. Um, John, when he asked me to do it, he said I, he asked me to be a reflector. Uh, <laughs> So we'll, we'll see what, exactly what that means. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna first give some comments about, um, about these two papers, both of which I thought were, were very good. Uh, and then I'm gonna give some of my own thoughts kind of in a slightly different direction. Uh, now when I give these comments on the paper, I, 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 I like to sort of pick some nits and, um, and, and make people a little uncomfortable because um, a, a happy panel is a boring audience. Um, and uh, I would say a board audience. Um, I don't know, you aren't being very excited though either. So, um, but I'd say, you know, I don't, we don't want people to stay bored here so, um, or to be bored. So I'm gonna uh, try to push them a little bit and so the things I ask might not be my views, it might be, uh, but I, I'm gonna um, ask them to sort of elaborate a bit. Okay, so there are three things that uh, they both, uh, they make, make these three, three points between the two papers. The first, set-asides are, are inefficient. Restricting participation reduces auction revenues. And warehousing pretty much doesn't make any sense. Uh, in this paper, this uh, it was actually a different paper of uh, Anna Maria's that made, made that point, not particularly this one so much, but, but Michael made it uh, in, in, in his paper here. Okay, now, 
The first point uh, on set-asides. There's a huge literature on the inefficiency of set-asides in lots of contexts. Um, and Michael didn't talk too much about Next Wave uh, here. He said he didn't want to go out. We don't want to um, kind of uh, belabor that, that disaster. Uh, but it's in the paper. And, and you know, it's not clear that the set-asides are the primary cause of the Next Wave debacle. Uh, you know, if you go back and read the literature on what went wrong there, uh, that was part of it. But Back in, back in those days, uh, the FCC required very small upfront payments, you know, the order of a few hundred dollars to participate in the license, uh, participate in the auction. They allowed the winning bidder to pay over a series of years, and they gave really generous credit terms to everybody who participated. That meant people who companies that participated in the auctions pretty much treated the license as an option. Um, and that drove the bids way up, and it, it was just a, you know, it was a disaster, including in other auctions like the IVDS auction before, before that. Um, so there's, I mean, there's lots of evidence on set-asides, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm not sure that that, that big one, um, that big disaster is, is the best one. Now, also, Anna Maria talked about uh, auction 73. She talked about set-asides and then into auction 73. Um, and talked about how uh, many, lots of small players did very well in that auction. Um, but there were set-asides in that auction, right? There were, set, there, there were, it wasn't actually set-asides, but there were bidding credits, right? Which is kind of the same thing um, for small and very entity. small. That's right. Um, so, you know, did, did those bidding credits contribute to how well the small firms did? And if so, does that actually mean it was, a very, it was an inefficient outcome? Um, or did they contribute to helping them and that was a good thing? Uh, so, you know, maybe you could just uh, elaborate on that, on that a little more. Okay, now, then the next point, that restricting participation in the auctions reduces revenues. Now, as an economist, um, my response is really, so what? I mean, uh, I don't care. Uh, and um, the point of spectrum auctions is not to maximize revenues. We care about the revenues for purely political reasons. Uh, because it's good. the FCC likes to say, hey, look, we raised all this money, just like, like Michael said. Um, and he also said that, uh, you know, he, he gave this theory that some people have, uh, I mean, he, he showed why a particular theory is probably wrong, under which uh, restricting participation might actually increase revenues, um, and said why that would be inefficient. And, but the, there's a bigger point there, which is that you could do lots of things to increase revenues that aren't efficient. Um, so why, as economists, do we care about this? Uh, I think we don't, unless it's, and I think the bigger point is the one that he made, which is that the auctions reveal, when they're done right, they reveal um, what the spectrum is worth, right? And so it's not, the, the, it's not the amount of money we care about so much, it's whether the auctions were done right to reveal the true value of that spectrum. Now, on the, on the warehousing issue, uh, so the companies, most of the providers that have Spectrum aren't using it all right now, according to Deutsche Bank. Uh, and it's hard to calculate these. I don't know how they calculate this exactly. Um, you know, Verizon's currently using about 75% of its Spectrum, AT&T about 90%, T-Mobile about 90% when you count the, um, the, the Spectrum it's getting from AT&T. Sprint's using all of it. Uh, now, that by itself doesn't mean anything because you want to, you want to expand and you want to have a path for, for moving forward. Um, and, uh, and then, and, and Michael says that, you know, the right way to look at whether there's actually warehousing going on is, uh, is through antitrust. And I, I agree with that because it sounds it's a foreclosure issue. And he says federal antitrust agencies can monitor the firms for anti-competitive warehousing. But what, what does that mean? Uh, what, you know, what, what are sort of the metrics we'd look for? And one thing that both Michael and, and Anna Maria uh, put up on the, on the screen was investment, uh, how, much these, how much different companies are investing in their networks. And the big companies are investing a lot. Um, and, of course, they should. They're big companies. When you normalize those investments, either by per subscriber or by, re or by, uh, by revenues, uh, they're, not that, they're not really different in any systematic way from the smaller carriers. In fact, as by uh, investment per subscriber from Q1 2011 to Q1 2012, Verizon's went down a lot and is lower than, I think, Metro PCS. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything either. And uh, so, you know, but, but if, if, if investment is the measure, what's the right way to normalize it? Really, you know, can you go, go come back to the warehousing issue um, and talk about what are the things that we really should be looking at? How would you, how would you ever know? Uh, because, I mean, I'm very skeptical of, of warehousing argument myself, but if, if you think that, there is, that there's a way for antitrust agencies to ever monitor this, what, what is that way? Okay, now let me move on more to sort of my, my, own, my own thoughts. Uh, and Michael said this, very well, that, you know, if we had more spectrum, none of this would matter, 
right? If to the extent that there ever could be warehousing, it becomes increasingly expensive for firms. It's just, it, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, it's increasingly unrealistic. Um, we, we, it facilitates entry and so on. So all our problems go away with more spectrum. Now, I don't particularly like the phrase spectrum crisis. I'm, I'm trying to annoy everybody here, by the way, um, uh, because I don't really know what a crisis means in this case. Uh, but as long as um, anybody is willing to pay a positive price for spectrum that is not being used efficiently right now, that means that there's a whole lot of inefficiency in the market, right? It's just it, the spectrum is being used inefficiently. And uh, maybe maybe that's a crisis. I'm not sure. But it means that, there's a, that we should be doing as much as possible to get spectrum out there. Now, the FCC basically has two uh, approaches. Actually, we know that the government should be contributing lots of spectrum too, but that's been, they've been trying that for decades and, and maybe, I mean, we've been, uh, lots of people have been trying to get the government spectrum into the market for decades. It hasn't, they haven't been successful yet. They should keep trying, but, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, so they have two approaches. The first is auctioning um, and the second is, uh, is through secondary markets. Now, in a sense, there's you know, it's not, we, one isn't necessarily, one isn't better than the other, right? There's no such thing as used spectrum. Uh, you know, any spectrum that you can reallocate to a more efficient use is good. And whether that comes through an auction mechanism by getting, you know, uh, spectrum that's not available for uh, civ civil use into, into the market, or whether it's a spectrum that's licensed but not being used well, both of those are good. Now, on the auction side, the FCC seems to be doing really well. They're pushing hard. They've been pushing hard on the incentive auction program, uh, and they want it. They want to get it going, and they're doing as, as much as they can. It's a hugely political issue, and you know you really can't ask for you can't ask for more. Now, on secondary markets, a little inconsistent. Uh, John and I have done a lot of work on secondary markets, and I actually think, um, in a lot of ways, overall, it's a big FCC success story that they've done a lot to reduce the barriers to making secondary transactions happen. Um, but more recently, I think their approach to this has been uh, less consistent uh, than, uh, and it's, it's not clear how their, 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 their actions, they're not considering how their actions affect secondary markets uh, and, and how it affects whether a spectrum is being used efficiently. All right, so let's take a look at the total amount of spectrum that's available, let's just say for broadband, because that's what everyone talks about by licensing. This is the total amount of spectrum in the relevant range um, that's, that's licensed that could be used for this stuff. I wrote, this is by um, share of, uh, who, who has it by, by share, and that's about, it's about a total of 166 billion megahertz pops. Now, um, these are all in different, uh, you know, different frequencies, so, you know, it, it's, it's not completely right to say that one has more spectrum than another because they all have so many different characteristics, but Clearwire has, Clearwire still has, has by far the most, the, the biggest block of spectrum, and a lot of its spectrum is very strange. It's leased, it's encumbered, um, but still, that's, that's the biggest block. Uh, Verizon is next if you add onto it the Spectrum Co. Spectrum, and then AT&T, Flight Square, T-Mobile, and so on and so down. So that's kind of, that's, the amount of input that's currently available. Uh, now, if the FCC could get more spectrum through auctions, that would that would go up. That would be that would be nice. Um, but that's what's there right now. Okay. Now, if we look at the total spectrum, uh, total license spectrum, but controlled by firms that are not operating networks, it's a total of about 36 billion megahertz pops. That's what's there right now available. Um, this is even discounting like Clearwire, which you know, which sells Spectrum and so on. Uh, this is what licensees hold that that they're not using, and you can see the um, that's a Spectrum Co. The blue plus a little bit of, of uh, Cox Spectrum down there that Verizon's trying to buy. Now, one thing to note here is that the the light squared Spectrum is right here, this block. So now we know because of what's been going on that that pretty much just got taken off the table. Uh, because it potentially interferes with GPS. Now, how much that's actually true, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not qualified at all to say. Um, but it sure sounds a lot like uh, a, a type of incumbency, making sure that uh, there's no that entry doesn't happen. The incumbents being government users of GPS, John Deere, and, and so on. Uh, and so, as a result, the FCC just took that off the table. So suddenly, the supply of available spectrum shrunk by a third, just like that. So while, we're, while they're sitting debating about the approximately 6 billion megahertz pop that um, Verizon wants to buy from Spectrum Co., the FCC snapped its fingers and reduced the spectrum supply by a third. Just like that. Um, and 
I think people don't necessarily think about it that way. They think about it as a purely a light squared issue, and whether you know did light squared get screwed. Um, you know, I don't care. I don't know. Um, but the but the bigger point is that the FCC is not thinking about the overall effects of what it's doing on on this so-called spectrum crisis. It it simply reduced the amount of spectrum available in one fell swoop. Um, and, and now by questioning the, uh, the purchase of Verizon, Verizon purchasing the spectrum from Spectrum Co, uh, that ha will have other effects on even future auctions. How much, how are people, how likely are new firms willing, how, how likely are new firms going to be to bid on Spectrum if they believe that their ability to sell it in the future will be questioned by the FCC? Markets don't really work well when that happens. Um, now, the FCC does have an obligation. I mean, they say in, in, in the various rules on secondary markets that most, spectrum, uh, most spectrum trades just go through uh, almost by, um, by approval, uh, sorry, by, uh, by, by notification rather than having to go through approval. And when it's a big deal, then they, they take a closer look at it. Um, but it's not sending, it's not sending a good um, signal. So, uh, so just to sum up, let's see, what did I write here? That you should think about spectrum holistically, coherently, and dynamically. What do I mean by that? It's an excellent question. I was, it was very late. Um, I might have been thinking about our grocery list for our um, co local co-op. Uh, but, uh, so, but, but the point is that the, when we think about spectrum, each piece does not happen in a vacuum. Everything that you do on one piece of spectrum affects how, um, how the market is going to think about, the spec about other spectrum going forward. Um, you know, don't obsess over the Spectrum Co. purchase and then wave your hand and make a third of the inventory go away without, without considering its effects on competition. Uh, recognize dynamically that what you're doing affects auctions and other secondary trades going forward. Um, and I don't get the sense right now that the FCC is thinking about this in a coherent way, that they're just sort of reacting to each little piece as it comes up and without sort of a larger strategy going forward. And uh, I think we need one. That's Thank it. You. Thanks. Okay, we should uh, we should allow perhaps a, a comment or two from Anna Maria and Michael, and then we'll open it up to questions before moving to our closing speaker for the morning. Um, just I guess to address a, a couple of of uh, the questions that uh, Scott raised. Um, perhaps in reverse order. Um, in terms of capital expenditure, um, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that you do get year-to-year -year variations for particular companies. Mm -hmm. In some cases, because of what they have already accomplished, what they still need to do, and all the rest of that. One of the more striking examples over the last six years uh, was Sprint, which reduced CapEx from $5 billion a year, more or less steady state, to $1 to $2 billion a year in 2007, stayed at that level till this year, and is now finally implementing a new uh, plan and, and going back up to that $5 to $6 billion level. That's probably the most extreme case we've seen. Um, they are also part of sort of the interesting question of what do you consider warehouse spectrum? In their case, how do you look at the spectrum at Clearwire, which is 150 megahertz that Clearwire is this year uh, finally talking about if they can get funded uh, deploying for LTE that they previously tried to deploy for WiMAX. That spectrum originally belonged to uh, Sprint, and Sprint decided to spin it off and create Clearwire. So, you know, when analysts look at Sprint's uh, spectrum, we tend to look at it as I did on my charts both ways. If you look only at the spectrum Sprint itself has, you may be seeing a, a very high utilization level. But is the Clearwire spectrum really just sort of a warehousing of Sprint spectrum? Hard to say. So going back, I guess, to the question Darren asked earlier, this is just, I think, the most extreme example of the difficulty of knowing kind of how to look at what is out there, who's using it, 
are the, uh, you know, reasons that it may not be an operation at a particular point valid or not valid, reasons of inability to get funding, reasons of technology not being there, all of those things. Um, as far as the early, the question he had going sort of back in, in his series on uh, designated entity bidding credits, that's been something the FCC has done traditionally to try and help small players play. In my numbers, I, the way I did my numbers, I attributed um, spectrum that was won by designated entities and eventually resold to larger companies to the larger companies So, as best I could. So when I said the small companies did very well, I mean the ones who are small, not ones who were designated entities that essentially bid to, the, to resell. Um, but, you know, it is one way of giving an opportunity to uh, smaller players to participate in the market, less extreme than some of the things that Scott was talking about in the context of next wave. And it, clearly the FCC learned something from the next wave experience about not being so extreme that you're going to allow or in fact encourage enable companies that ultimately are unable to actually use the spectrum because they can't get funded. Um, it's not particularly useful, efficient, economic <coughs> to give spectrum uh, on such favorable conditions to entities that ultimately aren't going to be able to operate. I think the FCC sort of has certainly learned that but has also not gone to the opposite extreme and the designated entity bidding credits are a way of not going to the opposite extreme. So I think they're trying to be as fair as ba and balanced as they can. It's not, not an easy equation. So Michael. I gotta say a couple of things. I mean, certainly I would agree that um, part of the next wave debacle was particular to what the commission was doing at the time, but I think the general point does still hold, and I think Scott agrees with that. And there's all sort of a continuum here. The extent that you give the um, some sort of favorable terms or subsidies or protection from competition to people who are going to come in the market anyway, then you're not going to have problems with the policy. And then to the extent that you say, no, I really want to get someone who couldn't otherwise compete and you know see if we can get new entrants or bring in a different range, then you're more likely to have these problems. So it's one of these things, the more likely these programs are to achieve one set of goals, the more likely they are to be a, um, a big problem. Other thing I mentioned is, yeah, it's not always, you know, we don't have the mess of the bankruptcies. When you have ones that might in some ways be, look as having been successful for the bidders, if you look at the um, C and F block PCS licenses, the majority of the licenses that were initially were set aside are now held by companies that were not eligible to bid for them in the first place. Okay, so it's not that these things got new entrance in, is what happened is people got them, then they had to go through the secondary market, and so what you got was delay in administrative costs and possibly um, various wealth transfers. So I agree next wave is, you know, it's the poster child for lots of things gone wrong, but I think the problems are um, inherent in the overall policy. In terms of revenues being pure politics and no one cares about them, you know, or no true economist does, a minor amendment to that. I mean, I think we do care as economists because I mean, the, the money is, like one would hope, it's either, well, substitute maybe it's just more, anyway, it's a substitute for tax revenues. And as you said, auctioning off um, the spectrum and having um, open auctions is an efficient way to raise revenue because it's a process you need to do anyway to allocate the resource efficiently. Again, that's assignment to the attorneys in the room. Um, and so why not assign the things, why not allocate the resource in a way that raises revenues and allows you not to have to rely on distortionary taxation? So in that sense, we do care, but I mean, Scott's you know, fundamental point is, though, let's not get carried away and then turn it into a revenue-raising device and then start taking on inefficiencies and view it as, you know, now it starts becoming more like a tax policy, and I think that's not the appropriate role um, for the FCC, either in terms of economics or its statutory authority. Um, lastly, lastly, let me turn to um, warehousing um, and just say, you know, you have a, it's a good question about, you know, how to, to normalize things and what's the right answer. And I don't know what is, you know, the best measure. The only thing I would point to is just that um, 
And again, I always tell students, you got my students, you have to do everything in relative terms. But the fact is, the carriers are investing large amounts of money in increasing their capacity and increasing their capacity, the capacities of their network substantially. Which I think again does raise this question of if it's, if it's all about warehousing, why are they doing it? I also have to point out, there's a, I think a bit of an irony in that. At least there's one, a set of people who say, well, this whole thing about the spectrum crunch and the need for 500 megahertz is a conspiracy by the large carriers. At the same time, they're encouraging them, uh, uh, sorry, accusing them of engaging in warehousing because it's a sort of a peculiar strategy to say, well, we don't want our competitors to be able to get um, spectrum, but let's see if we can get the federal government to put a whole bunch of it out there. Now, maybe it's because AT&T and Verizon are competing with um, the government, and the conspiracy theorists just haven't taken it far enough and didn't realize that they're actually a shadow <laughs> government. But I would have thought, if you really, at Verizon and AT&T, if you really wanted to warehouse stuff efficiently, you would say, let's keep it with the, D with the um, DOD, right? Let's do everything we can to make sure the federal government keeps its hands on that spectrum to stop anybody from being able to use it for commercial use. So I just point out, that I think there is an, an, um, an internal inconsistency there in, in some of those theories. Um, lastly, to um, Scott's, and this is, you'll see why this is my last remark, because I may be asked to leave after I say it. Um, <laughs> this thing on the warehousing, and well, how would you ever know? If you did try to do antitrust, how would you know? And oddly enough, I'm reminded of a story of a friend of mine who used to teach um, English in Iran. This was um, before the um, revolution. And one day he showed up at class, and one of the students was trying to cause trouble for him, so he raised his hand and says, well, I have a question. He goes, can you, t gets the, right. can you tell us what oral sex means? I mean, he asked the question in English. He goes, what's the term oral sex mean? And my friend to, said to him, listen, pal, if you don't know, just stay away from it. And I, can, <laughs> and I would say, in some sense, the same thing, and I think this is a principle of antitrust. I mean, if you can't, if you say, look, we can't come up with evidence, you say, what does warehousing have to do with oral sex? If you can't come up with a good measure and say, look, here's evidence to believe that these companies really are engaged in warehousing, then you should leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on that note, <laughs> we will uncomfortably worse. transition. <laughs> Much worse. Uh, Scott, any, any final thoughts before we move to the, to the final? Speaker. You can't stop them. I, no, I, I like the, the oral sex I, antitrust. I, 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 I was reluctant to let Scott <laughs> weigh in on that. I, he might take it to the next level. Uh, at any rate, uh, the closing speaker uh, today is uh, Chris Gutman McCabe, uh, who is a senior vice president at CTIA, the Cellular Telephone and Internet Association. It's an association that represents the vast majority of companies that uh, represent the vast, that have the most subscribers in the United States. So collectively, as I mentioned at the outset of this morning's talk, we will have heard from the academic sector and from the policy sector. And now uh, we are delighted to hear from the industry sector. I know that in, in uh, his position, he must hear uh, get more than an earful, let's just say more than an earful full from, his, uh, from his various firms uh, who are uh, seeking to get better public policy. We heard a little bit about that from Tom Power earlier today. We are thrilled to have uh, Chris here today. Please help me welcome him. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm going to close this up, see if it causes any impact here. Um, so usually when I, when I do a panel and I, and I listen to the preceding panelists, I, I tend to write down how they present information uh, so that it can help me, because I, I tend to do a lot of these. Um, Michael, I won't be writing down your last, uh, your last <laughs> analogy. Um, thank you, John, and thank you, Andrea, and the team at Georgetown for having me here. I'm very excited. Um, I'm particularly grateful to be, to be batting cleanup, to be going last. I, I have a wife and two daughters, and so rarely, if ever, do I get the last word in my house. Um, but I'm excited here, and, and I thought, uh, for those that, that, of you that know me, you know I'm a big baseball fan. Um, uh, Phillies have won five games in a row. That's important to me. Um, but you also won't be surprised, uh, if I like baseball, that I like statistics. And, and, and a lot of times when I give speeches like this or I testify, I, I tend to try to use statistics to drive a point, to make a point. And, and so in honor of the baseball theme, I was going to give you nine statistics that sort of, I hope, will set the table 
as to why we're here and why we're talking about spectrum. So the first one is 43. 43 is the percent increase in active smartphones on our networks from the end of 2010 to the end of 2011. So even though uh, smartphones were well in the market in 2010, the number almost, uh, almost uh, increased by half. 49, that's the percentage of the increase in, in uh, tablets and wireless-enabled um, uh, laptops. And by tablets, we're talking about the ones that Tom pointed out, the tablets that actually have CMRS connections to them. <laughs> Uh, the next number is 105, and that's our current penetration in the United States. So we actually have more wireless subscribers than we have citizens in the United States. So you'll see, you'll see a trend here. Um, the next two numbers, and these numbers were identified and derived uh, last year, about 12 months ago, and so both of them were derived in a 3G environment before we really had a full-on launch of LTE and, and a real explosion in, in also in WiMAX. So the first number is 122. That's the multiplier. That's the impact of a tablet on our networks as compared to a standard wireless device. So 122 times the impact in terms of data usage. And perhaps the bigger number and the most stark is 515. And that's the impact of a wireless-enabled laptop. Uh, the multiplier, the impact of it on our network as compared to a standard wireless device. So, so when you look at, at, at those uh, continued changes in sort of the uses, and then um, I, I'm, I'm proud to stand up here and say, you know, the United States really has taken the lead dramatically in the network side of the equation. We have 64% of the world's LTE subscribers. We only have 6% of the world's wireless subscribers. So clearly we're driving, we're driving LTE. And then uh, to sort of put all of that in context and, uh, context and why LTE and, and uh, advanced WiMAX and some of the other network upgrades are important, uh, the last number is 28. And what we're seeing is that a 4G network has 28 times the traffic of a, of a 3G network. And so those are all numbers that, that make us uh, look out and use words like crisis and, and things like that. We, uh, our team actually developed the looming spectrum crisis phrase because we looked at these numbers, these numbers that have continued to increase, and then we looked at what was in the pipeline, and we thought, wow, this is a looming crisis. The, the, the equation doesn't make sense. It doesn't, doesn't match up. So I'm just going to pause for a minute and say, you know, another benefit of, of bad and cleanup is you get to listen to the presentations, and you get to, to reflect, and then sort of in real time some, give some, uh, some, some feedback. And so I, I wrote a few things down. Um, first, um, I'm happy to see that there seems to be really wide agreement on the benefits that, that wireless and, and mobile broadband brings to our economy as a whole. I think if you look back, I've been at CTI for 12 years, so if you look back just five years ago, and you think of what wireless was, it was really um, directly a carrier consumer equation. And it was mostly voice driven. Uh, there was obviously some text and some data usage, but it was all uh, carrier to consumer. And in the last five years, what we've seen is the use of wireless devices, wireless applications, wireless networks to drive things that I don't think we thought were possible. Um, mobile banking, paying our bills, shopping, reading the news, um, managing inventory, you know, taking care of our, of our fleets of trucks, reducing energy consumption, and even educating our children and helping us improve our health. I've been the beneficiary of some M Health applications myself. So it's, it's nice to see sort of this evolution, but it also identifies for us and for you why we're here talking about Spectrum. Um, it's also comforting to see that we're here talking uh, not about if we should bring Spectrum, but when and how. So I, I, in spite of the efforts of our friends at NAB at times to, to challenge this notion that, there's, that there is some form of crisis or, or concern, um, we've gotten at least to the point where there's an understanding and a recognition that we need to get Spectrum to market. Um, what we've seen in the actual usage is actually outpacing what the predictions were. So if you, if you went back and plugged in the actual usage, and so from 2008 to 2009, then 2009 to 2010, then 2010 to 2011, the percentage of data usage increased triple digits each time, and that percentage continued to go up. Uh, we were at 123% at the end of 2011, but perhaps most interesting, from the end of two, or last six months of 2010 to the last six months of 2011, compare those two, and the increase was 134 percent. 
So the numbers are continuing to go up. And, and what you see, if you have a double and a double and a double, it's an eight times increase when you go back and look at that. So now we're beginning to see how people who predicted that we'd have a 15 and 20 times increase uh, you know, three or four years ago are now starting to look back and suggest that we may have underestimated where we're going to be. So, um, you know, the, the industry, and I think uh, Anna Maria and others have put up some statistics about capital expenditures. And we've seen over 20 billion in capital expenditures over each of the last five years. But perhaps the most uh, interesting statistic is in each of the last two years, so, so two years during a really violently down and troubled economy, the number has been in excess of 25 billion. So the, the capital expenditures are actually going up and we're seeing carriers do their part to roll out more efficient technologies, to move towards PICO and FEMTO and different types of DAS and, and smaller cell architecture. And I was, I was sort of peering around as I was sitting here uh, in my chair, and I noticed about a half dozen different sets of cell sites on all the buildings around here. So if you see that just in this area, you get a sense of, of how much we're, we're, the industry is really trying to drive efficiencies. Um, so how do we get there? How do, how do we get and how do we address this, this spectrum issue? Um, you know, I know, I think everyone understands that, that taking the recent um, uh, Spectrum uh, Act that, that was adopted into law and trying to implement it is going to be difficult. But obviously, uh, we believe strongly that it's achievable. Um, we, we really believe that we're going to have to press and push on our friends at, at NTIA and the FCC to faithfully and, and expeditiously implement those elements of the act. Uh, some of them are timed for three years, others are timed for within 10 years. Um, we recently filed with the FCC and, and NTA, we called it our blueprint for broadband spectrum, but it had a rapid, a really accelerated pace for them to move forward and, and uh, get the, the broadcast spectrum to market and also get the, multi, the multiple bands that were identified in the act to market. And part of the reason, and it wasn't really rocket science, and, and we didn't employ some of our friends in the economics community to, to help us develop that time frame, we actually looked at what the FCC had said and what the president said in his memorandum, and we worked backwards from there, that if the goal was to get 300 megahertz in five years and 500 megahertz in 10 years, well, in order to get to the 300 megahertz, you really need to begin to adopt, uh, to, to um, uh, initiate the NPRMs at the FCC now, and begin to adopt some of these rules in the, in the very near term. Um, while we've suggested that we should move expeditiously, we also recognize and understand that you have to move sensibly, that there has to be an, an understanding that the rules need to be uh, understandable, they need to be straightforward. Uh, from the broadcaster's perspective, it needs to be something that encourages them to participate. And, and for us, that means it has to be simple and easy to understand. Um, uh, regarding how Spectrum is, is brought to market, and, and uh, Michael and Anna Maria and even Scott talked about this a little bit, um, what we would say is the Commission should definitely take a look at what has happened in the past and learn, uh, really take some time and learn. And we heard uh, words like frontline and, and others, and we heard about tailored auctions, and we heard about the 700 megahertz auction. Um, I think you could look at the 700 megahertz auction and identify exactly how not to run an auction. And, and those of you who've, who've heard me speak before have probably heard me say that. But my, my significant concern with the 700 megahertz auction was that there were no fungible licenses. So a bidder couldn't step into the auction and say, I'm going to bid for A initially, but if I don't get A or I'm getting pricing pressure or bidding pressure, I can move to B. And if I don't get B, I'll move to C. And if I don't get C, I'll move to D. There really were no fungible licenses within there. The D block had a public safety obligation. The C block was, was a very large block of spectrum and had open access requirements. The A block had interference from the Channel 51 licenses littered throughout the country. And so the only one that really didn't have any of those encumbrances was the B block. And shockingly, as Anna Maria put up on the screen, that's the one that went for the largest, by far, price per megahertz pop. And so when, when we look back at CTI, the 700 megahertz auction, we look at sort of the regulatory encumbrances. We look at how it was uh, you know, tailored towards certain business models, the frontline business model, who ultimately didn't end up participating. And we say sort of tailoring specific auctions or coming in with significant regulatory encumbrances are, are things that we are going to really oppose. Um, when it comes to participation in the auction, uh, Scott, I think, said it best, and he put it right up there on the screen, and I like that. Uh, bring more spectrum. You bring a greater amount of spectrum 
to market at one point in time. More entities can participate. More will win the spectrum. It'll get out to all of uh, CTI's members and, and more. And anyone who wants to participate will have a, have a real chance to participate. Um, I guess I'd say fourth, I was, I was happy to see and, and, and have the panel start off with Tom and have Tom talk about the commitment uh, and, and the, the focus of the administration on really moving government spectrum to market. If you look at the incentive auction process, you know, I think we are very hopeful that 120 megahertz will come to market, but that is about a third of the 300 megahertz and, and certainly uh, a fourth of the 500 megahertz. And so then there needs to be a focus on where additional spectrum is going to come from. Um, we know that NTI and the administration has identified some bands. Um, we really, we have said, and, and uh, Tom uh, teases me often, he did this morning again, but you know, we really have focused on 1755 to 1780 as an initial band, um, in part because you do drive economies of scale and scope in terms of international usage, but also uh, because Congress passed a law that now has identified and set for auction and license a logical pairing for that 1755 to 1780. So we'll continue to work with our folks at NTIA, the Department of Commerce, and, and the administration to really make sure that we move those bands forward, move that spectrum forward. A portion of that effort or a, a, an element of that effort will obviously be investigating sharing um, we know that that's going to be a key element of bringing spectrum to market in the future. What, what we have argued, what we will continue to argue, is that the gold standard will be clearing spectrum. We have countries that we compete with, uh, Germany, the UK, Japan, Italy, France, South Korea. They're clearing hundreds and hundreds of megahertz of spectrum for their commercial operators to serve consumers. And I think if you know anything about any of those countries, the closest one has less than half of our population. Many of them have a third or less of our population. And yet these countries are bringing hundreds of megahertz of cleared spectrum. So while we will work and, and believe that sharing will help to, to drive um, bringing some of that spectrum to market in a more timely manner. For us, the focus has to be ultimately on clearing the bands um, and, and, and really pushing to make sure that, that some of the cleared spectrum is, is brought to market. Um, and then for us, making sure that that spectrum is brought to market in a flexible way, that it's unencumbered, that, that, um, that there is an ability for carriers to take it and drive business models, <clears throat> earn a profit, serve consumers, keep prices low, you know, continue to invest and drive innovation, that's really going to be, that's really going to be key. And then I think uh, one of the other, obviously, key elements is going to be secondary markets and making sure that there, that there is an environment that allows spectrum to move from lower valued use to higher valued use. So obviously one way is through auctions, another is through secondary markets. And no matter what you think about individual transactions at any point in time, I think there's a general understanding in the economics community and, in, and within policymakers that taking some of that lower valued or lesser uh, valued use and moving it through a secondary market mechanism to a higher valued use is, is really key. It's a key element of our spectrum framework. Um, so I guess I would just say, I would sort of wrap it up to, by saying that you know, this is about continuing to drive innovation and investment in our country. Um, this is about ensuring that what we've seen in the last five years, and I, I've heard Commissioner McDowell say this recently, that we never lost uh, the lead in, in, wire, in the wireless ecosystem within you know, the United States versus the world. Uh, I agree with that. But what I have seen in the last three years is pretty amazing. Every advanced device gets launched here first in the United States. We have 87 R&D facilities that have moved into the United States in part to take advantage of the fact that we're leading the 4G deployment, we're leading in terms of launch of new handsets, and we're clearly the epicenter of the apps world. And so in order to maintain that, in order to make sure that other countries, very advanced, very developed, very technologically savvy countries, don't take the lead back from us, uh, whether it's South Korea or Japan or Germany or the UK, we have to make sure that a key element of our, of our spectrum future is getting the federal government to identify bands that the government currently is using and perhaps using in a way that isn't uh, quite as efficient as it should be, and also making sure that we get some of these bands to auction as identified in, uh, in the act. So uh, I guess that's how I would sort of wrap it up. Um, I'd say thank you again, John, and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much.
questions, questions for Chris? Okay, thank you. Oh, <laughs> don't go away so quickly. <laughs> yes. Here's a question here. One moment. Uh, Bob Martin with Lion Science. Um, when you look at the history of the auctions, about 2690 megahertz to 12 gigahertz, there's nothing in there. They're all below that or the LMDS, which is pretty quiet. Sure. Do you ever hear in your constituents, given the, the growth and in interest in PICO and FEMTO cells, a value in licensing spectrum for your constituents above 2690? For those that kind of use? Uh, to be honest, our focus really has been below three. We've usually said three, really focusing below 2.5. Um, trying to drive out, I know you asked a question earlier um, about comparable spectrum for some of the government users. Part of the analysis that we have done and, and will continue to do is that um, a lot of the uses below three gigahertz do not need to be below three gigahertz. So in terms of, uh, and I was happy to hear Tom say um, uh, sort of comparable uses or, or not comparable spectrum, comparable performance. For us, Identifying those areas where you can move incumbent users out, you know, fixed microwave, uh, some of the satellite uses. I mean, there are a whole bunch of uses that were moved below, particularly even below two gigahertz, uh, that just don't need to be there. And if we can identify those and get them out, uh, so I'm not answering your question, but I've done this often, so I'm going to choose not. But the, the reality is the focus uh, is below right now, really below the, the, the 2.5. And, and believe me, this will continue to evolve. We've seen announcements in the last week, uh, and it's been, you know, the CARES has been deploying this a lot, but we've seen announcements in the last week about really accelerated, uh, you know, femto cell and, and, and pico cell, sort of the small cell architecture, DAS and, and others, uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, in the, you know, some of the CARES announcing tens of thousands of deployments in the next couple of years. You know that at some point uh, below 2.5, you can't bring more. There are legitimate needs that need to be below 2.5 that can't move, or others, like your friends at NAB, who don't want to and they can say no more than others can. Sure. So, so do you see a point at which below 2.5 won't work anymore? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, my assumption is that, that the technology, as it always does, will continue to evolve. Uh, for us, the, there needs to really be a laser focus. So NTIA identified that it brought over 100 megahertz between 3.5 and 3.6 to market and, and suggested that that went towards the 500 megahertz. The only problem is there aren't really capabilities or technology in place at this moment in the mobile sector to, to take advantage of that. And so for us, the, the, you know, the really the, the laser focus. So um, I'm going to suggest that, yes, maybe the technology will get us there. And yet, in the short term, the focus has to be below 2.5. There are, you know, just tremendous efficiencies that we can wring out of, of those bands. Uh, the broadcasters are a perfect example, 294 megahertz in every market. And in many, the, the, you know, the high-powered stations operate on 100, 110. So uh, for us, the, you know, getting the focus in those lower bands will really help to, to improve this equation that we're talking about. Other questions? If not, let me, uh, let me take the liberty of asking one final question, and that is that you made a pitch for the role of secondary markets here, and I think very oftentimes people think, at least traditionally, have thought of secondary markets as transactions between commercial parties. Mm -hmm. And yet, as Anna Maria mentioned, there is now uh, uh, enabling legislation that may allow contracts perhaps between right. commercial entities and public agencies is the role for what is the role of industry to promote that sort of activity can you are you free to now and if not how might you be freed to begin that process of pushing forward uh, with with freeing up spectrum from uh, public agencies sure. through just straight through secondary markets. Yeah, uh, right now it's it's not a capability that I think either we have or we've investigated. And and part of the issue is, and this is what we we came up against with the broadcasters, is um, to some extent 
or not to some extent, uh, the, the technology needs the ability to have access. It, it doesn't do any good if you get one 10 megahertz license in New York City. It's great to have Spectrum in New York City, but if you have one 10 megahertz license, you're not going to have a manufacturer necessarily develop a chipset and a handset and, and, and network equipment to work on that. So um, what we see in the broadcast space is the FCC playing the role as the integrator. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I can, I can envision uh, a future where if there are government entities that hold a nationwide allocation, nationwide assignment, and they have a, a, a chunk of spectrum that makes sense, and they are allowed to engage in uh, some form of a secondary market transaction, the, I think the industry participants would, would eagerly, happily participate in that. Um, and it's good to see that we're beginning to look at beginning to look at mechanisms, at least talk about mechanisms that would insert some form of a, of a market mechanism into the government use of spectrum. Uh, we've talked about fees in the past, but we've also talked about sort of seeing if we can, uh, you know, get an idea from them of what is operating where in terms of, uh, you know, uses and, and do they have similar operations in other bands that they could move to. Um, but, but we do, John, we really need to begin to investigate all of these different ways of, of driving spectrum to market. We're doing it. We, uh, um, we filed something with NTI and the FCC to investigate um, sharing and, and to look at sharing with the hope of driving spectrum to market in the shorter term. Again, the gold standard being clearing the bands ultimately. But we're, we're trying to look at creative mechanisms to, to uh, bring spectrum to market because, again, we don't see um, a significant pipeline uh, out there right now. Uh, we see a commitment to a pipeline, but we don't see a, com a significant pipeline. And if you see these numbers, and again, every time I look at the numbers, the actual numbers are outpacing the predictions. And so that's, that's not an equation that, that is, uh, that is um, or it is an equation that is troubling, I guess, to our manufacturers and to our carriers. Chris, thank you very, very much. Well, with that said, uh, that concludes this morning's event, but stay tuned for other events that the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy will have. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Hope it helped make your day.